Good evening. The executive session of the Wayne Board of Education Public Works Session meeting of March 4th, 2021 was convened virtually and hosted in the Media Center of Anthony Wayne Middle School, 201 Garside Avenue, Wayne, New Jersey. The statement of compliance setting forth time, date, and location was read in accordance with the requirements of the Open Public Meetings Act, and the roll call was taken. The meeting was recessed and is now being reconvened. Can I get a mover? Mr. Giordano, Mrs. Scher, uh, please rise for a flag salute. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Would you like to do a roll call, Mr. Moffat? Mrs. Albanese? Here. Mr. Bubba? Here. I do not see is Mr. Duffy with us. Not at the moment. Okay, not at the moment. Mr. Giordano? Here. Mrs. Kazan? Here. Mrs. Kumar? Here. Mr. Pavlak? Here. Mrs. Puttup? Here. And Mrs. Shear? Here. Here, sorry. Here. Dr. Toback, start with you. This Board of Education meeting is being held at Anthony Wayne Middle School again. Although other than for a handful of district employees, the meeting is largely a virtual meeting, as has been the case throughout the pandemic. The meeting is open for public view and public participation using Zoom, and is also broadcast on Channel 77. It seems as though every Board of Education meeting this year is a meeting of great consequence, and this board meeting is no exemption. This evening's agenda includes two very important topics. First, we'll have the first public input session for the next year's school budget. Budget development process this year has been a challenge with many factors that influence the budget and some level of uncertainty. Mr. Moffitt will be taking everyone through a detailed budget presentation in a few moments. Following Mr. Moffitt's presentation, we'll be taking um, the, the board members and the community through our phase five return to school proposal, which was already shared with the community last night to allow for review in advance of this meeting and an opportunity for residents to formulate questions. Based on the questions we received last night, we developed another FAQ, which was distributed to the public this morning. Based on that feedback, we also made some changes to the original presentation to clarify different points that appeared to create some confusion. We're making every effort to respond to questions from the community because we know how important these decisions are for our students, our parents, and for the broader, broader um, community. We know the road back to normalcy has been long and bumpy and that many are experiencing great frustration along with a certain amount of exhaustion. Although it is very clear that the virus is still out there and remains a threat, we also see signs of progress when it comes to the vaccine and a generally downward trend when it comes to new cases, hospitalizations, and other metrics surrounding the virus. If you notice on the agenda, there is no resolution to approve a plan tonight. This meeting is a public work session. Mrs. Reichman and I will be sharing the proposal in a few moments, this is the standard process the board follows, especially when considering such an important action, such as the next phase of our return to school. The intent is to allow two weeks for public comment and feedback, and then we will incorporate that into a finalized plan for Board of Education consideration on March 18th. In addition to the feedback we received by email, we'll also be asking parents to complete a survey specific to your child. This will be an incredibly important part of the planning process as we look forward to finalize our um, efforts for the spring. The survey will be distributed to parents tomorrow electronically and will be open for one week. It's a very important survey and we hope every parent will complete one survey per child. But um, we'll get to that a little later. Right now, what I'd like to do is introduce our business administrator, Mr. Moffitt, for a presentation about the budget. Mr. Moffitt. Thank you, Dr. Toback. And if I could ask Mr. 
I should say Dr. Burchard to start the presentation. Good evening to all who are in attendance. Good evening, welcome to Wayne Township Public Schools tentative district budget presentation for the 2021 to 2022 fiscal year. The presentation will provide an overview of the financial condition of the district, discuss the full day kindergarten program being implemented for next year, a listing of important dates in the budget creation process, influencing factors on the budget. District initiatives included not only in the general fund portion of the district budget, but will also identify funds available through grants. Initiatives that were included in the budget, macro level information, estimated tax impact, and then a summary of the tentative budget, also known as a preliminary budget at the end. Wayne Township Public Schools is an overall positive financial condition. It has a surplus position of 4.2, a capital reserve coming in at 5.8, which is a reserve that could assist the district address some future facility needs should they uh, arise. The district also generated about a million seven that we could use uh, in the future budget, and that will reduce the need for taxes. The board also has available to it a bank cap of about a million dollars and the board of education is proud to be at their last year of a three-year phase in period for a full day kindergarten program which uh, the thir third year cost is coming in at about a million seven for the 21-22 budget year again that's a three-year phase in plan with the final year being a 1.7 million dollar cost this is the wrong presentation. It's not the right presentation. Okay, bear with us a moment and uh, we'll look into the slideshow being corrected. I'd sing, but you really don't want to hear that. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Mrs. Petta. <laughs> Most like to hear it. Hmm? We would like to hear that actually. Oh, I'm sure you would. <laughs> no, thank you. That'll that'll remain on YouTube for the rest of my life. <laughs> or or end up in a TikTok. <laughs> Shut up, Stacy Sher. Be chuckling because I don't know what a TikTok is. I know you are, and I have no clue. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Ah, uh, technology. Okay. Do we have a resolution? Yes, it should be coming up. Okay, we're getting there. Please be patient. Sorry for the delay. The full day kindergarten program was contingent upon a number of items. The first was continued increases in state aid. And although we had a minor setback last year and reduced the amount of additional state aid this year, we anticipate this year being 21-22, the district anticipates $1.3 million, which will go a long way to offset the full day kindergarten program here in the district. The Board of Education also invested in Preakness School and created the Early Childhood Center, which relocated the 
pre k program from a number of locations in the elementary schools and brought it centrally to the previous school we had a minimal financial setbacks although covid nineteen pandemic was a major issue we were able to budget around it and will be able to bring the three year phase in program to fruition and offer it starting september one uh, obviously, we have continued Board of Education support in bringing the community to the full day kindergarten. And we also uh, experience a reduction or pace of other facility or capital projects here in the district, although there are a few that we continue to, to watch and implement. Uh, the, the reduction uh, has allowed us to focus on the full day kindergarten and prepare classrooms for that start in the fall. Full day kindergarten was not contingent upon these items listed here on the slide. The first is it did not cause a situation where we had to redistrict our elementary schools. We did not have to put art and music on a cart, nor did we have any major reductions to our extracurricular activities. We didn't have to reduce or diminish our educational foundation or our opportunities, nor did we have an increase in class sizes. So the kindergarten Full day kindergarten did not cause any of these items, nor did it cause an increase in class sizes. The cost of the full day kindergarten program moving from a half time basis to full time program is estimated to be $1.7 million. That is inclusive of 15 full time teachers, which includes salaries and benefits. 15 classroom instructional aids, lunch monitors, additional furniture for all program needs, instruction materials again for all program needs, uh, professional development also for incoming teachers. So they're ready to go on September 1. Again, total estimated budget of $1.7 million. The big question when we talk about the full day kindergarten program is where is the money coming from and at this stage of uh, the 1.7 million dollar number for the final phase in amount and the cost of the full day kindergarten uh, is offset by an increase in state aid of a million three and we were able to go back and reduce uh, the general fund appropriation lines uh, district wide uh, to offset the additional amount of 300 and $39,000 uh, to totally offset the $1.7 million. Here's a list of important dates. Today is March 4th, and we're sharing a preliminary budget and tentative budget with you in this presentation. And that's the public's first input session. The second input session is dated March 18th at a regularly established Board of Education meeting. The actual tentative budget is due to the New Jersey Department of Education County offices on March 20. Uh, once they receive it on March 20, they'll review it, ask the district several questions. Um, they, upon our approval, then we're able to, meaning the district is able to share and advertise information with the general public and advertise in local news sources with our public hearing set for May 6, which is the final adoption of the district budget. Influencing factors on the budget planning process this year, on the revenue side at least on this slide is listed a tax levy increase of about 3.1, which is 2%. Bank cap was available to the board at a, a little over a million dollars. We did benefit from an increase in state aid, which is a formula aid from the state of New Jersey, which increased about $1.3 million. Unfortunately, we will be losing some revenue as it relates to uh, employee contributions due to implementation of chapter 44 which was passed this past summer and the board will have to absorb about a loss estimated at this time at seven hundred and thirty seven thousand dollars we will be able to continue to use general fund balance which is surplus which again is a tax relief at 1.7 million dollars and um, we also um, released earlier um, in february uh, the elementary and secondary school emergency relief uh, funds, 
which is as known as as or two which is a second wave of funds from the federal government to offset the burdens placed on school districts as it relates to the covid nineteen pandemic influencing factors during the budget process as it related to appropriations we knew that if we took salaries this year which is 2021 and uh, increase them by at least two percent that would generate roughly two million dollars in projected costs for next year health benefits another large component of our district budget that's 12 percent um, and that would generate about four thousand dollars in, in costs for next year we knew we had the final phase of the full day kindergarten that was budgeted at 1.7 and pcti tuition increase which we just received uh, indicates an increase over last year of about $341,000. Earlier in the presentation, you heard me mention ESSER II fund allocations were released in the amount of $1.8 million. Uh, ESSER II funds uh, can uh, support various different programs, uh, but uh, what's listed here are the areas that we'll have to address. Uh, which would be programs and areas most impacted by COVID-19 disruption. There's about $1.5 or $1.6 million available to those programs. We'll have about $118,000 available for learning and acceleration programs, $45,000 that's available for mental health and support services. And right now we're planning with the idea that we have at least $100,000 available for uh, PPE and related supplies. Again, the total budget is about 1.8. Just note, we continue to plan. This information was shared with districts um, the middle part of February, and we continue to plan for this grant. Initiatives included in our general fund budget will include the continuation of Envision Math, school-wide literacy, National Geographic and Amplify Science programs and the all important related digital subscriptions. Funds will be available for online learning assessment digital subscriptions. We'll continue with LinkedIn data warehousing and assessment system and associated professional development. We'll be acquiring two new textbook series. The first is in art history at the high school level. The second is AP history. We'll also have funds available for the continuation of the diversity and equity and inclusion goal and the related professional development training program. And of course, the phase three of the full day kindergarten program. A withdrawal from capital reserve in the amount of $1.2 million will allow the district to implement the backup generator program, which is a multi-year program addressing some critical needs that we have. Um, the three areas that we'll start with uh, is Pines Lake Elementary School. That project as part of the overall program is uh, estimated at $530,000. And that will allow us to maintain in the event of a power outage, uh, a fire alarm system, lighting, refrigeration, and IT function. So we'll keep them up and running as well as uh, keeping the heating and ventilation system operational. Second area has to do with our transportation department. We have a location at the North Cove. That project uh, is estimated to be $270,000. That again, uh, critical infrastructure is communication and pumps. Again, these are our water pumps at the site and obviously communications are for vehicles and dispatch. Uh, and it'll be portable and flexible enough for district wide use. Uh, the second location in transportation is our bus garage which uh, is estimated to be a project of $360,000 and, and the infrastructure there we're concerned about is maintaining communications with our vehicles. Again, uh, communications from driver to main office. Uh, we want to make sure the alarms uh, are maintained. And again, we also want to maintain our IT functions and com uh, communication software. Um, part of that bus garage plan is also to address mechanical repair equipment to make sure it's operational in a power outage. Initiatives included in the budget by way of a lease purchase arrangement through PCIA uh, and, and an estimated amount of $1.5 million would include a telephone system phase two upgrade. Uh, 
two hundred and fifty thousand dollars estimated the continuation of the district's one to one computer program in the amount of seven hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars which would cover the following four grades the first grade in that's district wide fifth sixth and ninth grades also included in the lease purchase would be two special needs school vans which would be equipped with wheelchair lifts at $88,000 each. That comes in about $176,000. Three new 24 passenger vans at $234,000. And one new and two used facility vehicles, most likely two used vans and one new pickup truck. District security will continue to be upgraded. We are awaiting uh, funding of the Alyssa Law Grant, which is in the amount of $439,000. Uh, we had hoped to receive this amount uh, in the current year, but unfortunately uh, it's been delayed and we anticipate it next year, which is good because we were able to continue to plan and identify two new areas that we could uh, upgrade or expand. Um, so that's James Fallon and John F. Kennedy, both elementary schools, so we were able to add those to the list uh, from last year. So uh, they all include Thunas Day, James Fallon, John F. Kennedy, Lafayette, Packenack, Ryerson, Albert Payson, Terhune, and those are all elementary schools, and George Washington Middle School also get an upgraded or expanded security vestibule. We're going to continue to add cameras as needed, and that's been funded uh, year after year from an NGISIG, which is our insurance uh, carrier, through a grant program that they offer annually. And uh, as previously stated on another slide, the PCA funds had uh, financed the Phase 2 phone system, which is integrated in our overall security uh, plan. This slide, uh, you see a pie chart that represents total revenue to offset the operating budget, uh, the subject tentative budget. As you can clearly see, uh, the largest portion is from the tax levy, and we're uh, looking at about 91.6%, which if you think about it, is about 92 cents on every dollar comes from the tax levy. Two areas I'd like to uh, highlight are the fund balance, which is 1%, and that is funds available from the prior year. Again, fund balance that is used in this year's budget to offset the need to raise taxes. So it's a form of tax relief. The other uh, relief I would like to say is the capital reserve, which we're close to 1% at 0.7. And that offsets the programs that we have in our capital projects. And then the, the second largest category of revenue for our operating budget is state aid. And that comes in at close to 6% at 5.8. Here's another pie chart for you. It reflects the appropriation side of this year's budget. And if you add up academic programs of 44%, student support at 11%, student transportation, again, busing, 4%, and student activities at 3%, that gets you to 58% of the overall pie chart, uh, represents direct contact student-related services with uh, facilities coming in at about 10%, administration at six and employee benefits finishing out at 22 percent. An estimated tax impact of a tentative budget on an average assessed home here in Wayne Township. You'll see uh, as the average is listed there as 229,309 which if you look at the impact on an annual basis, it's $186 monthly at $15.47 or 51 cents a day. We have others listed, as you can see, for house 100,000, that's an annual amount estimated at $81 and a half a million dollar property as assessed would come in at 405.
the tentative budget summary looks as follows the tax levy increase from one hundred and fifty five million two hundred and fifty nine million roughly two point six percent and that includes a bank cap amount of a million dollars which was available to the district state aid increased by one point three million dollars which is a twenty two percent increase from the prior year we were able to use a budgeted fund balance again this year at one point seven five zero which is no increase over last year the estimated federal amount which is the semi amount is reduced slightly down to a hundred and thirteen thousand eight hundred and fifty one which brings the total operating budget in at about a one hundred and seventy four million dollars which is roughly a point five percent increase over last year non-public programs hover at about a four hundred and fifty four thousand dollars federal aid which is esea and idea come in at about one point eight million dollars charter school transfer payment is forty two thousand five hundred and twelve that's new for this year we did not have a charter school allotment in last year's budget we also have a debt service tax levy which is separate from the general fund balance or i should say the general fund operating budget which comes in at 2.9 million dollars which brings the total preliminary budget or the tentative budget up to uh, 179 million dollars which is an increase of 2.3 percent over last year i would at this time like to point out that this tentative district budget in the presentation here tonight is in the process of being reviewed and approved by the board of education and will ultimately be submitted to the county office department of education to be reviewed based on feedback by or from the board of education or the county office this tentative budget could be altered and changed uh, but once it is approved by the county office uh, the district would be uh, would be able to advertise in anticipation of the budget hearing which again is scheduled for may 6. again please note that all of the financial information in this presentation is subject to change. This slide is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moffitt. That was a very thorough presentation. Uh, at this time, I'll open it up to the board if you have any question or comment, or you could go through the Mrs. Albanese. Hi. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Moffitt. Um, I have a couple of questions, and maybe information that would be helpful to the whole board. Um, could you tell us to date or estimated for the year, however easier for you, what our total COVID expenses or related expenses would be, whether they're cleaning or PPE or PPE or whatever, um, and then what money we received either through the SR2 grant or in any other fashion that we received to offset that. Um, I know we received the million three in additional state aid, um, and I'm interested into the justification for adding the bank cap in. For people who aren't aware, the bank cap takes you over the 2% tax levy. So I'm interested in the justification for why that was added in and why it was felt it was needed. So I'm not asking you to answer them now, but maybe you could share them with the board. Thank you. Yes, I'll get back and put that in a Q&A. Yes, the board, um, as we've mentioned through the Finance Committee, there will be a Q&A that Mr. Moffitt will update for all of us to participate and read uh, so that we're fully aware of what's going on. Uh, did anyone else want to have a comment here this evening before we move on? Okay, thank you. Dr. Tobak or Mrs. Reichman, who wants to go first on the phase five plan. And thank you, Mr. Moffitt, again, that was great. So I'll get the discussion started, but before I do that, I did just want to mention that the budget presentation represents really a culmination of many months of work on top of all demands placed on the business office through the pandemic. So it includes thousands of projections and estimates and um, just a whole host of considerations that really are too numerous to mention. I did want to thank Mr. Moffitt and all of the employees of the business office for all of your effort to put together uh, a wonderful preliminary budget. Um, so yeah, at this point, 
Dr. Bouchard, if you could pull up the presentation, phase five proposal. Okay. Go back. Okay. So um, what we'd like to do is, um, is start a presentation and um, later on, Mrs. Reichman will get involved. But I did want to ask her, she's nice with explaining this graphic. She found this graphic and uh, I was wondering, Mrs. Reichman, would you like to explain um, how you explain the graphic? Sure. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation generated around this graphic around the state. And uh, the, the point is that um, we're all traveling the same road and it has been a very um, bumpy road this year for all of us. And ultimately the goal is to end in the same destination, which is to have a full return to school. But, you know, depending on the district, depending on funds available that are available, depending on what the COVID situation is, there's so many variables to consider. Um, we've all had to take different roads and different twists and turns um, throughout this journey. But again, the ultimate goal is to bring everybody back. And um, tonight we're planning to share with us our next proposal for phase five. Dr. Bouchard, next page, please. Okay. So just to get started, it's good to look at where we are right now. Okay. So this is the first slide um, for tonight. It's our current plan. So um, as you know, at this point, we've merged our high, our high school cohorts from three to two. And this week we eliminated our virtual Wednesday. Um, and as you can see, April 19th is the date when the proposed phase five would start. And you can see in between now and then, we also have a spring break from March 29th to April 2nd. Okay, so that is our current plan, our current phase. If you can go to the next slide, please, Dr. Bashar. Okay, so this is um, information that was provided by Governor Murphy regarding the status of schools across the state. And so you can see that there are at this point 110 schools out of the 811 cited that currently have all in-person learning. You see that 533 have hybrid instruction of some fashion, that includes us. Um, and you can see that there are 142 districts in the state that have all remote learning. Okay? So that's where we stand compared to the rest of the state. If you could go to the next slide, please, okay. So the important updates, um, one of the problems with the pandemic is things happen very quickly. And so actually this is not totally accurate. Um, our teacher vacancies though, this is accurate. Our teacher vac vaccines are available based on occupation starting on March 15th. So that is a huge development. And so hopefully that will um, be expedited for our teachers so that we are able to get our teachers vaccinated as quickly as possible. I did have a discussion with Mayor Vergano this week about setting up some clinics in our schools. At this point, he indicated that probably would not be possible. Um, he did, um, I was thinking of the school system. Um, he was involved in a meeting with other mayors from across the state trying to seek a, out a solution or a way that we would be able to do that, particularly based on the fact that we have our own clinic here in Wayne, one of the few communities that has our very own um, vaccine clinic. And um, at this point, that's not permissible. We've also reached out to St. Joe's Hospital in Patterson to see if perhaps we might be able to form a partnership with them to allow our teachers to be vaccinated quickly and easily. So the part of the update that's not accurate says Passaic County is no longer identified as a high risk area as identified by the New Jersey Department of Health. So unfortunately today, a new map was produced and we'll show you that in a few minutes, but we are back to being a high risk area. Um, so that means our quarantine requirements go back from, it says here from 14 to 10, now it goes back from 10 to 14. But there's other encouraging news out there. For example, Pennsylvania eliminated travel, testing and quarantine requirements completely. Connecticut is on the verge of making some changes to um, their plans for how to respond to um, out-of-state travel. Um, we are also seeing a good sign with students beginning to return in greater numbers at our elementary schools. And we'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, so right now, the new rate that we put together led to 54 additional daily substitutes that we've been able to hire. So that's really great news for the district. That puts us in a very strong position. Um, then the other thing we have is, and what's not quite accurate because we found out after school that we have more staff members returning. 
So instead of four staff members, we have seven staff members that were on medical leave that are returning to work after being vaccinated. So that's good news. I'm sure there are more to come. So added together, there's definitely progress. There's definitely reasons to be hopeful and things are moving in the right direction. If we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so here you can see the percentage of the request for change to instructional models just recently from February 15th to March 1st. Okay, so the fact of the matter is that you still have a significant number of students going out to um, all virtual. And then, but you have more students that are coming back for in-person hybrid. So, and you can see that the numbers at the elementary level are significant in that students are returning for in-person hybrid. And you can also see at the high school level that there's a significant number of students that went from being hybrid to now being all virtual. And so that's a trend that has been in place for quite some time. And you can see at the end, the 262 in person, that's the change to in person, and then the 180 to all virtual. Okay. So still a, num a significant number of students in the district going to all virtual. Okay, the COVID-19 update, that's something we provide at every one of our meetings when we're talking about um, our next phase or if there's plans or there's things that we're looking to do with regard to our recovery from the pandemic. So Dr. Bouchard, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is, the table that I regularly include for board meetings. And so it generally shows the trend in New Jersey and there's a line of best fit. And so you can see that in general, um, all the key statistics that are maintained for the coronavirus for each state are on a downward slide. So that's great news. And though you can see at the very end of the graph that there is a little bit of an uptick right now. And I'm sure that's probably what led to Say County being once again, along with other counties, being identified as high risk. So we do have an uptick, not only in the state, but also across the nation. There are, um, you know, there's, there's more, as things open up and, and people start going about their lives, um, there are now, um, there's an increase in the number of cases. If you can go to the next slide. Okay. So this was the activity report from the New Jersey Department of Health as, for the week ending February 20th. Okay, and you can see at that point that Passaic County in the Northwest part of the state was identified as a moderate risk area. If you go to the next slide, please, Dr. Bouchard. This is the slide, the most recent slide that came out yesterday. And it shows that, or I'm sorry, today, and it shows that the week ending February 27th, so there's a little bit of a lag. Now the Northwest part of New Jersey is high. So we're now back to being a high risk area. Okay? So that's the latest chart that is available. If we can go on to the next slide. So here you can see very clearly on February 8th and then compared to February 25th, their numbers are approximately the same. Um, there is activity in the schools and there are cases that um, just today that are not included in this chart. There's a number of additional students and there were a few staff members that tested positive and are now in quarantine. So um, you know, students are back. They're interacting with one another. And so there are some cases, but it's still within reasonable limits and not too significantly different from where we were on February 8th. If you can go to the next slide, thank you. So I just wanted to show that this is our most recent New Jersey Department of Education guidance, which will come into play tonight because ultimately um, what we're going to talk about is social distancing. That's one of the big things that um, pertains to our next phase of um, reopening. So six feet or the maximum extent practicable that can be achieved by ensuring students are seated at least six feet apart. But like I said, there are options for the district if we reduce it and we provide additional PE. And you can see that there. And particularly the physical barriers are identified and are commonly used to allow for this. Okay, so at this point, if we can go to the next slide, this is the CDC executive summary updated February 26th, noting that, and of course this is not a law per se, this is not like an absolute, but um, ultimately the recommendation is to maintain the six feet. And um, that's really the standard that still exists for social distancing. So there are, um, like I said, there's a lot of things that we need to talk about. And we're going to get to a discussion about a questionnaire because we do want to know about the preferences that exist within the community. 
Um, if you can go to the next slide. Okay. So at this point, this is where I'm going to jump off, and Mrs. Reichman is going to take over to talk about schedules and some of the specifics of the Phase 5 plan um, at this point as it pertains to the elementary students. Dr. Bouchard, you can advance to the next slide. Um, so I'll start by sharing the proposed preschool schedule. Preschool students um, will be invited to return five days a week. We will maintain the AM and PM sessions. The AM session would run from 8.20 to 10.20. The PM session would run from 11.20 to 1.20. And then we would uh, maintain special ed programs daily from 8.20 to 1.20. Students will continue to receive a snack um, in an outdoor period without uh, a full lunch or recess period. And we would have desk shields for all classes. Um, one thing that's really important to note is not all desk shields are, are created equal. And I've just been following the conversation around the state and, and really listening to teacher comments and parent comments as schools reopen their doors and bring students back. We made a concerted effort to find the most sturdy and durable desk shields so that each student would have their own. Um, it would be something that would stay with them, travel with them, and something that is reliable once it's in place on their desk. There are many very inexpensive options, and um, we did not feel like that was something that was really sustainable for staying in place and not causing a disruption to class. So a lot of thought went into any of the decision making. We can advance to the next slide. Um, this is our K-5 to proposed elementary school schedule. K-2 to students will return five abbreviated days. Um, school would end at 1.45. Special education, which is our, our OCR, out of class resource, and ESL students um, would return for the five abbreviated days in grades three to five. Um, and I'm sorry, K through five. A 145 dismissal for all students, followed by the win period, what I need now, which would run from two o'clock to 245. Students will continue to receive a snack and an outdoor period without a full lunch or recess period. So DEXO will offer and um, provide grab and go lunches at dismissal. Desk shields would be in all K-2 classes to maintain distancing um, to the greatest extent possible and make sure that we have that extra layer of protection, knowing that we very likely would not be able to maintain six feet. And we would determine the feasibility of a return, full return for grades three to five on May 3rd. So just to clarify, all K-2 students would be invited to return Monday through Friday. Grades three to five, we would start by bringing back our OCR, which is our special education students and our ESL population. And then we would reevaluate um, with a plan to return the remainder of the students in three to five on May 3rd. We can go to the next slide. This I added in because as um, once the presentation was shared out last night, many emails came in. We did, um, Dr. Toback and I spent quite some time last night reading through all the emails. Many of you are aware we did put out an FAQ today just to respond to some questions that appeared um, on many emails. So we did realize and recognize that we need to, to provide some additional information and some clarification. And as a result, we shared the FAQ and made some updates to the presentation. So this was just um, to elaborate on the special ed piece. I think there was some confusion. Out of class resource student um, is our special ed population, students who are in the class for part of the day and then uh, leaving the class for part of the day for special education concentrated classes. We can go to the next slide. This again is just providing more information. Many of you are asking, why are we not bringing back grades three through five in its entirety on April 19th? Class sizes in three to five are significantly larger. We have district guidelines and we are very, very strict about maintaining those guidelines. Whenever we exceed those guidelines, we add an additional teacher and additional class. So at, th at this point, we know that um, our kindergarten maximum class size is 20 students. First grade, we have a max of 22, and second grade is a max of 23. In, in anticipation of the return, 
we would expect that we would not have 100% return uh, based on the information we have now, the number of students who are remote and reading the volume um, of email that has come in. There are many, many parents who still indicate that their preference would be to maintain their child as remote throughout the end of the year. Uh, anticipating that we could have 70% of the students in the class, which is the greatest likelihood. With the desk shields, we would not be six feet apart, but we would still have a, a manageable number. Uh, for, for three to five, it's really important for us to gather all this information because we could have situations where we have 28 students in a class with a teacher. That's a very crowded class with older kids, larger desks, and there would be some consideration to reassigning kids um, possibly setting up some remote classes once we have the numbers. But again, that would be information we'd gather from the survey and take some time to sit down and, and work through so that we can offer parents up options so, and maintain social distancing to the best extent possible. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so for the kindergarten proposed schedule, this was a challenge because we wanted to minimize disruption. Uh, and we also wanted to maintain the program. We have teachers who traveled to schools. Uh, they need travel time and they also need to have um, travel time and they also need to have some time for prep planning and set up in, in their separate location. Currently, the way it's set up, there is an overlap time and any student who's in our kindergarten program has a second teacher. So right now, the way it stands, Current traveling kindergarten teachers teach morning and afternoon sessions in two schools. So we wouldn't be able to maintain that with the two and a half hour sessions, five days a week with the new proposed schedule. We also did not want to have to reassign your child to a new teacher because that would be disruptive and new parents have indicated that they would be uncomfortable with that, understandably. So in order to maintain the current teacher assignments, this schedule would give us the travel time so that the teacher can get to their next class and maintain their two sessions sticking with the class assignments they current, currently have. Students who have a traveling teacher may be asked to switch to an AM, if they're in an AM, to a PM session or vice versa. Um, we could also present options um, if a parent was unable to switch their AM to a PM or the other way around to reassign them. But again, until we know what the return looks like, uh, we won't have all this information. So this will take some time. If the current two and a half hour schedule was maintained, many kindergarten students would be assigned to new teachers. So I'm, I'm repeating what I said, but I just want to make it very clear that we did reduce the time, but the time will be made up, if you look at the last bullet, with a virtual special, which would be offered outside of the two hour kindergarten block. Currently in the two and a half hours, they have their special built in. So we're making up the time afterwards. And, and again, this is in an effort to keep your child with their current teacher and really not disrupt the schedule and assignments for the teachers who travel. We could go to the next slide. From two to 2.45, we will continue to offer the wind period, what I need now. And that's a time where we can provide academic support, social emotional learning, and other opportunities, which will be detailed on the next slide. We can move ahead. The presentation will be updated on the website tomorrow because we did make some changes, but this was something that was shared last night. Students are dismissed at 145, and any student who's remote at that point can begin the win time immediately after the 145 dismissal. Uh, other students obviously will be en route to travel home. So at two o'clock, um, they can join one of these groups. Each week, students will be assigned to one um, small group instruction for a specific skill area. They'll also have an opportunity um, if they're involved in instrumental lessons, band, Windows Art, any other special programs um, to sign up for those periods. There will be availability daily to meet with counselors 
and sign up for different social groups and sessions that are offered by the counselors. And we also recognize that many parents may have a desire to choose some days to have their children do something outdoors on their own of choice. And it might be a way for them to socialize with neighbors and things as the weather gets nice and they can be outside. So there'll be a lot of flexibility with this. And you know, all of this was considered and thought about very critically with the feedback and information that parents were able to provide for us. I know many parents wrote in today and had questions about having a child at home, K-1-2 student, and then having a third, fourth, or fifth grader who one in school and then one who's working from home. And they expressed concerns about driving their child to school and then having to pick their child up, what would they do with the at-home child? There'll be lots of flexibility. Uh, when you're driving your child to school, if you needed to bring your other child with you, which we understand, um, there will be flexibility and a time period when students can log in to their first period. The same thing at the end of the day, there'll be time um, in advance of dismissal for kids to log off at, before joining the win period. And what we would suggest is that you discuss this and communicate with your classroom teacher so that they're aware and the building principal. And again, we can be very flexible to accommodate whatever your needs are. We can go to the next slide. Um, at this point, I will share the secondary plan and we can go to the next slide and we'll start with middle school. Middle and high school will be returning to a full day for middle school students. We will maintain the cohorted model. We did see that um, we have many more middle school students returning to school, which we are happy to see. And with the Wednesday return, students would be in three days one week and two days the next week. We'd be alternating between the A and B cohort. Go to the next slide. Here you see the full day schedule starting at 8 a.m. and concluding at 2.45 p.m. We can advance to the next slide. Um, middle school lunches. Uh, that was something that was not a challenge to sort out at this level, because as you can see, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade students eat lunch at different times. So we do have flexibility. Um, each lunch will be broken into two groups. One group will have a recreation time outside. The other group will eat lunch in their designated location. We'll have prepackaged lunches offered from Sodexo. Students will be able to spread out with six feet of distance in the designated areas. This is a, a time where uh, infection really can spread and we have to be diligent about making sure that our students are six feet apart. The designated lunch areas will be sanitized between periods and whenever possible, students will have the opportunity to eat outdoors. We explored the idea and just received information about renting tents for our middle and high schools. And this would enable many students to eat outside at, at both levels. And we would also be able to use the tents to have or hold outdoor classes um, when lunch is not being served. Go to the next slide. Academic support for our middle school students um, will be offered. We'll have after school programming for academics and social emotional needs and um, book clubs, guidance counselor check-ins and targeted math and ELA programs are a few things now being planned and prepared for, and more information about this will be forthcoming from the individual building principal. Next slide. This is our proposed full day high school schedule. Again, we will maintain two cohorts. Cohorts will continue to follow a four day block rotation, and we go back to the 7.20 a.m. start time and the 2.19 end time. We can go to the next slide. Uh, Sodexo will offer prepackaged lunches. Students will be spread out in designated locations to ensure six feet of distance when eating. Again, we are looking into bringing tents to both of our high schools to expand the eating area and offer outside opportunities. Staff members will be present to monitor students during the lunch period. Seniors will be permitted to leave the campus to eat lunch and we will continue to make sure that each area is sterilized um, between the periods. Additional support for high schoolers. 
uh, will be offered um, academic support sessions, counselor support groups, and for virtual students, we'll have um, Google Meets available so that they can participate in these opportunities. And more information about this will also be provided at a later date. I know many people um, have written in and asked about combining the cohorts for high school because the numbers are low. I, I think it's important to also share out that I've received many, many requests from parents who said they don't call into meetings but wanted to um, just put it out there and make it known that they were not in support of combining cohorts. We have had a number of outbreaks in the, in the past couple of days. Uh, the concern about combining cohorts and moving so quickly is we um, are still not out of the woods. Daily um, have notifications being sent out of students and staff members who are required to quarantine. And this could potentially end up in a full school shutdown. So maintaining the two cohorts to start until we have more information gives us an opportunity if we needed to shut down classes or a cohort to maintain school for the other cohort. I think it's important with the information we have now to move slowly and, and see how things go. And it's something that we can reconsider and, and revisit. We can go to the next slide. If, if you look at this slide, what it shows you is with all the protocols that we're putting in place with the proposed plan, um, we're basically falling into the medium risk category for most things. The CDC and the Department of Health in Wayne and our county superintendent um, is still recommending maintaining six feet of distance. And I realize that is not consistent across all the counties. Pasea County has, the numbers have been high, um, we have had outbreaks in our district, which we're reporting daily. And, you know, we are prioritizing bringing kids back and, and doing it as safely as possible. The death shield is one measure that we're taking. The tents in the middle of the high school is, is another measure that we're taking. And just taking a cautious approach with the larger classes to reevaluate the needs and consider the possibility of hiring more staff and then determining locations is something that's super important. And we can go to the last slide. So if, um, if I could talk about the surveys real quick. One of the important parts of the planning process will be a survey that will go out to parents tomorrow. We're also going to do some other surveys, but um, for the purposes of this meeting, we're going to talk about um, the surveys as it pertains to our parents and uh, for our students. So the key questions that we will need to answer is how many students will be returning? Um, we want to know how comfortable, because we've seen a lot of different feedback from you know, various members of the community, um, parents who in some cases are comfortable knowing that social distancing standards would not be able to maintain, in other words, students return to school, but even if the classrooms are fuller, uh, we may not be able to maintain the social distancing standards, and there are plenty of examples of districts across the state that are functioning in that way. Um, other parents are not comfortable. And at this point, especially like at the elementary level, we still have, even with the influx of students, we still have about 25% of our parents that have determined that they're gonna keep their kid virtual. Okay. Um, we talked a little bit about kindergarten earlier. Mrs. Reichman indicated that the plan that we're recommending would allow for um, uh, the, the children to maintain the same teachers they have. Um, in some cases, there might be some other things we can do, but we want to assess how flexible parents might be with changing teachers because that will allow for some additional um, opportunities to change up instruction and maybe to meet needs a little bit better. So we're going to find out a little bit more about that with our survey. Um, we also need to find out how willing parents are to commit to the instructional model. So this is a big topic in the community. We know that we've received um, some questions, some call-ins about the desire of parents to be able to maintain the flexibility that the district has offered when it comes to deciding whether your child will be virtual or will be, I'm sorry, will be virtual or will be in person. Um, so that's something that many people feel is a strength of the plan that we've used this year. And we understand that that is highly valued by many of our parents. Um, one of the things though that would really help is if we're able to find out if there are parents who are saying for whatever reason they have at home or for whatever belief they might have, 
if they are absolutely certain that they know their child will not return for the remainder of the year. So if we can identify the parents that are, that are saying, absolutely, I know for sure my child will not be returning, that might help us out depending on the school and the situation. We might be able to set up all virtual sections for some of our students. And then from there, we will be able to have a full in-person, not a hybrid, full in-person opportunity for learning for the students that are now um, back at school in person. So that may be helpful, but again, it's not, it's not something that's required. If parents are comfortable with sharing that, that's great. If parents are not comfortable and you wanna retain that in independence and your ability to make decisions for your child, then that's fine too. But like I said, if there, is, if there are parents out there that, that truly know that they're not gonna return their children um, for any in-person instruction, that also helps us. So the other thing I wrote here is, will there be an effort to gain the system? Okay, so this is um, not meant to offend anybody, but what it is meant to do is um, it's, it's, a, it's a consideration anytime you have a survey, right? Because in the end, if you do an anonymous survey, um, especially with the technology we have available at a school district, there's really not much we could do if one person decided to take the survey 50 times and another person decided to take the survey 75 times, we would not necessarily know that. We do, we are able to monitor IP addresses, but even then a person could basically complete as many surveys as they have devices. So um, we, we need to make the survey personal. Okay? And so what that means is that the survey is kind of gonna be a, a combo. We're gonna um, ask parents to determine their comfort level with some of the, the things that we described, and also to determine what their actual plans are when it comes to April 19th, okay? So ultimately this will be a survey that will um, largely pertain to a return on April 19th, April 19th, and each parent will be asked to complete a survey for their child. So ultimately um, you may have um, different beliefs about what you would like to do and the survey will allow you to express that in addition to what your specific plans will be. So um, that's the survey. And like I said, that will go out, it'll be distributed electronically and parents will have one week to complete the survey. You can go to the next slide. I think that's it, right? Okay. So that concludes um, that presentation. Let's open it up to the board for any questions or comments. Mrs. Kumar. Hi, um, so I wanted to thank you for really going you know, into detail about everything, but also um, going out and making sure that we get those tents because I think that's really key to our ability to possibly serve lunch and be able to open full time, um, really as far as safety and everything else. And I just hope that in our community, we're able to hopefully continue on this downtrend and uh, be able to open more. So that's it. Anyone else? Mrs. Cher? Oh, it's always me. Okay, so some of these concerns I've already brought to the district's attention, but being that it's a public work session, I, I want the public to be aware of what I'm thinking. Um, so first thing was you mentioned the OCR kids. Some of them are only pulled for two subjects like math and, and language arts is usually what they're pulled for. So I'm curious, are those kids, if they're going to be in five days a week, they're going to go to their separate room for the math and English, but then for science and social studies the rest of the day, are they going back? So they're mixing with the other kids or how's that going to work? Um, again, not asking you to answer all these today. It's just, just putting out there. Where, where, um, I personally think the survey should have gone out already. I'm a little concerned that it hasn't. Um, you know, we're presenting a plan and then we're going to put the survey out. If people say they don't like it, they like it. What, you know, we might have to just change this entire plan. Um, I want to see if the teachers are being surveyed on their thoughts about cohorts, kids in the classroom, watching oh, all the different aspects of it. I think the teachers have, you know, a crucial say in what should be happening in the school since they're in it every day. Um, 
for the elementary schools, I'm a little concerned about the process. I am very happy. Let me start with that. The K through two is going to be in school. That's wonderful. And the special ed and ESL. What I'm concerned about for the elementary level is that right now we have the kids and I could be off on my timing, but I believe they're leaving at 145. At two o'clock starts their win program. I'm assuming we have kids that take a bus, so they're not getting home at two o'clock. I'm assuming even the kids that are being picked up from school by the time they get home. So now I have a kid who's been uh, in the school all day, still probably online for a lot of it um, because there's virtual kids and you want them to, within 15 minutes, they, a 15 minute time period, they're going to get picked up, go home, sit down, probably eat something and get right back on the computer. Have we looked into possibly keeping them there till like 2.30 and getting, and doing, I'm not saying doing away with win because I know that's when they get their extra help, but somehow I feel like it more be, might be more beneficial if we're keeping them in school longer hours because I believe the teachers don't take their elementary, don't take their preps and lunch or preps and or lunch till after the kids leave anyway. So I'm not saying keep them there till 320, but I just don't see a kid running home in 15 minutes. That's not going to be a, very, a kid, you know, when you're going to extra help, you, they need to be paying attention. So jumping in on a call, none of these kids are going to be happy. I don't see that as a very beneficial time to be helping them personally. Um, I was wondering if we had considered making longer periods of time for the decision between virtual and hybrid. Again, deciding every two weeks, it's, it's ridiculous. There's no reason for it. Um, I, I know we received an email about it. I'm not taking a seat away from a kid. Of course, you're still getting your education, but you either choose virtual or hybrid and you stay that way for at least a month, if not more. That's my opinion. Um, if there's any, if we can consider pushing the K through two date, if we could push that earlier, then maybe we can get the three through five in by April 19th when the rest of the schools are going to be opening. Now, I realize that you're saying it's the numbers that are going to be a problem, but the numbers are not going to change by May 3rd. So the three through five are still going to have 28 kids in that class. Those numbers aren't changing. So I don't see the difference of why they can't come in April 19th instead of us just considering them on May 3rd. Um, I know I'm throwing a lot at you. I'm sorry. I, I have a, a lot of concerns. Um, as far as the WIND program goes for the elementary, is this more planning time for the teachers aside from their planning that they're already doing? Um, is, it an, uh, is it an opportunity? Like, I just want a little more explanation on it. If I have a kid in math today who's not getting the lesson at all, am I saying to that kid, hey, Johnny, come to win today? Or is it pre-scheduled? I, that's, I just want to, I'm very confused about the win and I just wanted to get some more information on that. If it's scheduled in advance, if the teachers have to plan for it, um, stuff like that. And then for the middle school and the high school, you had talked about the time that they're getting their extra help, educational help and social and emotional is after school programs. However, after school doesn't really work. That's, you know, when a lot of them have sports and or go to band or, you know, whatever they're doing. And are these programs virtual? or in person, since some of them are going to be at school and some of them are going to be virtual. I don't understand how that's working either. Um, have we considered in, in the high school level for lunches, letting juniors leave the building too? At Valley and Hills, there's shopping, uh, I'm sorry, not shopping, food that's basically across the street from both of them. So I, I know some of them, they wouldn't have cars, juniors, a lot of them, but there is walking distance and it's gonna be beautiful out have we considered because it would put less people in the buildings to make it easier for us figuring out lunch. I'm almost done. Um, my biggest question, and you're gonna hate this question, but I have to ask it. Why are we waiting till April 19th? I see no reason why we are waiting till April 19th. That is 
so far from now in the grand scheme of things. If we have to do state testing, then we're basically bringing these kids in for state testing and that's it. So they're not getting their education, their normal education back anyway. So I'm just curious why all of this would have to be put. There's no reason I don't see why it couldn't happen within the next like three weeks. I don't, you know, I just think April 19th is very far in the future from now. And I would like to see this happen much faster. On that note, I'm going to say thank you for the presentation and all the hard work you're putting in. I absolutely appreciate it. And I know I'm just putting another wrench in the plan, but I think it's necessary. I will say on a side note, my daughter went to school for four days today and I'm looking at a different kid. So anybody who doesn't think the social emotional is making an effect on the high schoolers and the older kids, they're wrong. I see it every day. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Pavlak. Just a couple concerns. Um, I echo Ms. Mrs. Chair expressed some of the concerns that I do have, but just a couple questions that I do have. Um, in the elementary model, how are we providing an inclusive environment for the three through five kids? They're doing a share for special ed on their own. Where's the inclusion? Uh, I'd like, you know, if you could get to me on that. Um, also, the uh, cohorts in the uh, high school, let's say we have to shut down cohort A. Is cohort B now going to go five days a week? Or are we going to stick to the schedule of having nobody in school, you know, three days one week, two days the next week? Um, it's a concern. Um, I, I would like personally to move up the schedule if possible, especially with the um, K for two. You know, if it's possible to um, maybe we take a look at it and see if we can begin that maybe the middle, you know, in two weeks or so. And there, there are, I mean, are there are vulnerable populations, the little kids, and they need they need in person more than our middle school and high schoolers do. Everybody needs in school. Don't get me wrong, but that population, I, I think, really needs to thrive. I mean, we're basically in a lose lose situation. All right, we have so many students who have lost either parents, relatives, friends, family members, whomever in this situation. And, you know, one concern to me is about this rollback is, to me, it's not all about academics at this point. And some of the stories I'm hearing, the way some students are being graded, we need to remember, these children have a lot of things going on at home. That social emotional part is a, going to be a major factor in bringing our kids back into the classroom. And I'm glad to see that we've considered that, but I'd like more information on that too, how we're going to achieve that. You know, we all wish that we could come back to school and it's a lot more than just winging the doors open saying, hey, we're back to normal, all right? We have no objective yardstick to measure what loss is, all right? We've never experienced the situation we've experienced over the last year. So we don't know how to measure this. So I, we have to deal with the social emotional part of this as well as the academic part. It's not all about catching up on academics. We need to embrace and bring these children together and give them an environment where they have, where they're able to come together. And I think we need to do that quicker than later. Um, I mean, I, I have notes upon notes and I'm not gonna just, I'm not gonna go on, but I, I, I just, I just ask that we take a look at this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pavlak. We all still obviously, I'll go ahead, Mrs. Albanese. I agree with a lot of what Mr. Shear and Mr. Pavlak said, so I won't uh, bring up my same questions. Um, one particular item that maybe stands out to me is um, 
snack time versus lunch. Um, in the elementary school, when you're taking off your mask and eating, you're taking off your mask and eating. As a lot of parents have said, their children are eating lunch. Um, if we're going to say you're leaving school at 1.45 to get home for 2 o'clock to get back on a computer, that child still isn't eating lunch until perhaps 3 o'clock, if that's the way we're going to look at timing. So to me, it would seem to make sense, as Mrs. Shear suggested, that the students do stay for a full day at that point if snack time and lunch time are becoming synonymous with taking off your mask and eating. So I agree with that. I agree with the fact that if we could look at moving up the time to get um, K through two students back in earlier, I also agree with the fact that numbers for three through five are not going to change. If we're going to look at using desk shields in replacement for the six foot uh, social distancing, that it makes sense for us to look to try to bring those children back as quickly as possible. So I just want to echo, I know a lot of those points were made, but I think we need to look at if lunch is the issue, lunch may already be happening. And if that's the case, racing kids home to get on a computer makes no sense as opposed to allowing them to stay in school, do what they need to do because they've already eaten. So I think that we need to look at that possibility too. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, this is great. Oh, oh, Mrs. Putup. <laughs> I want to thank I want to thank the administration. I did not think it was possible to have more moving parts than what we already had, but everything seems to be multiplying and I can only imagine the effort to put all of this together for the community. So I really want to thank you. I have a concern that Passaic County rates were dipping, but now they're back up. I have a concern about spring break and families traveling and staff traveling and the week after we get back. I know what I'm about to say will not be popular. I was hoping that the district would consider going all virtual the week we get back from spring break. And then reopening, but moving up the plan as it was presented this evening so that we're not waiting until April to fuller, fully realize the plan as it stands. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Putup. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, I want to thank the administration. Obviously, a lot of work and effort has gone into this plan. Uh, and the purpose of a public work session is for us to vet this. It's a proposal. Um, it's not carved in stone. Uh, everyone should continue to send their questions to Dr. Toback and Mrs. Reichman and express your concerns. And we, you will receive answers um, before we have to uh, reintroduce this, introduce this at our next public meeting. Um, like anything else, uh, some fine tuning is of benefit and definitely share those comments and concerns. And that's what we're going to be doing shortly. But first, uh, Mr. Moffitt, uh, revisions to the agenda. Yes, we have a few tonight. The first, uh, will occur in T, Emergent Human Resources, items one through 11, specifically number three, which is approval of appointment. Appointment of district staff. Number two, appointment to read LTR ASSP. Item number four, which is approval of revised items. Revised leave number two, uh, ID number 3392 to read as follows. 
January 21, 2021 through March 9, 2021, paid sick days. March 10, 2021 through March 15, 21, personal days. March 16, 2021 through June 30, 2021, FMLA without pay and without benefits. Benefits noted below should be three, March rather, 16th, 2021 through June 15, 2021, benefits. Item number five, which is approval of staff leaves. Number one, ID number 4855 is withdrawn. Number seven, approval of permanent substitutes. Number one, add PC number six, uh, excuse me, PC number 99-11-50 backslash EMN. And that is the end of the changes to tonight's agenda. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moffat. Uh, just looking at how many people we have online tonight. Um, this portion of the meeting is open for comment on agenda items only. Residents are to state their names, addresses, and subject matter. Comments may be limited to five, oh, I'm sorry, three minutes per person. Members of the public are discouraged from speaking negatively about an employee or student. The board bears no responsibility for comments made by the public. Comments regarding employees or students cannot be legally responded to by the board. Other comments may be responded to tonight or at subsequent meetings under old business. So can I get a mover? Mr. Giordano, Mrs. Sher. Okay, let's get started. Hi, this is uh, David Ginsburg from 2NUA. Uh, first off, a uh, big thank you to the board and the administration for your continued leadership. I think the proposal is extremely strong. Um, I have a second grader personally at Lafayette, um, and so a lot of my perspective is coming from there. Um, I also do love the full day K option, by the way, uh, that, that's moving forward. I think it's very exciting for our district and there's a tremendous amount of positives we'll bring to our community. Uh, I do think, uh, to, to answer sort of Dr. Toax's question uh, from the parents' perspective, I do think parents should have the ability to maintain flexibility with the chosen instruction model. Um, I think that has been a big strength of ours. Um, to Ms. Scherer's point, you know, maybe uh, you know, once a month you can change it versus maybe multiple times a month is a little too much, but I do think we should maintain that flexibility. Uh, I think I wholeheartedly agree with Ms. Putup's concern. Uh, it's very legit. Um, about spring break. Uh, I think we are foolish if we believe families will not be traveling and teachers will not be traveling, um, you know, more than our immediate states, uh, our neighboring states. So uh, I actually would be uh, in favor of all virtual the week after spring break. And then uh, again, going with public's idea of bumping phase five up to 412, where you start the five days a week for K to two and et cetera for um, the other grades. So phase five start on 412. A um, couple questions for Dr. Toback, if you can answer, obviously coming uh, out of this in, in FAQ, is in the five-day model, can you just walk us through, um, you know, when school deep cleaning will happen, right? Um, is, it, is it after the kids leave at 145 in the elementary, um, or when will that happen? Also, if you can kind of lay out um, just some examples of what a class schedule uh, for, for elementary, uh, again, whether it's K through two, you want to use it as an example or not. Um, what that looks like when they go back five days. I'm assuming uh, they're in their classroom all day with their teacher versus not going to specials and other things like gym or art um, to certainly limit exposure. So if you could clarify that, that'd be great as well. Um, would love to see um, pictures or renderings of these desk shields and just a little clarification. It was hard to hear um, Ms. Rice when she spoke, but um, are they fixed to the desks or is it just another thing that the kids have to bring home with them each night? Um, and I understand with the desk shields in K through two, um, the six feet won't be um, able to be maintained social distance. So what are the desks going to be apart? Three feet, four feet, um, just a little clarity there, I think would be great. Obviously in phase five masks, uh, sounds like can continue to be mandatory, which is an amazing thing. Um, but will the windows remain uh, open in the classrooms, I assume as well. Um, and lastly, I, I excellent point by Mr. Shear on uh, the wind timing. And I agree, um, you know, my son does not take the bus, um, but certainly by the time we pick him up, get him home. And by the way, he hasn't eaten lunch at that point, get him some food. Uh, I don't think a virtual win at two o'clock is feasible. I think either they stay later and do win in school, or if it has to be a virtual, no problem, but start that win at like 2.30 or 2.45 
to give uh, the elementary kids some time. Um, and the last question on when, if you could answer is, will the schedule for when be determined by the teachers as when the students need to go? And I ask because uh, I do think when's a great program, but since it's been implemented, I think my son has been uh, asked to go two, maybe three times max. Um, and it's, it's been implemented for some time. So just trying to understand how uh, the teachers will be deciding that schedule. Um, and then Dr. Toback, how will the survey be distributed? Um, this is another question I would love to know because okay. I know um, it's hard to- um, That's your time, Mr. Ginsburg. Okay. Thank you so much. Next. Hi there, Cindy Jaffe, 10 Sherwood Street. Um, I'm, I'm probably gonna have to call back because there's no way I'm gonna get to everything, but um, I wanna start with just saying that virtual, and uh, again, I'm speaking at the high school level only. I am of the strong opinion that virtual instruction is not working and hybrid instruction is not working. And I've sent many emails outlining the reasons that I believe that to be the case. I have not had one email responded to as of yet. I'm not gonna waste my time or your time repeating all those reasons. But the takeaway is that there is a lack of incentive, a great lack of incentive for high school kids to return to in-person learning. It's evidenced by your own numbers on the slide tonight. Even with the virtual problems, they still are choosing virtual, the vast majority, and many of those who are hybrid officially on paper are calling in on a day-to-day -day basis and going virtual. I'd like to know what is being done to basically address all the problems that I have pointed out several times with hybrid and virtual and why the kids are choosing to do this and parents are allowing them to. And um, basically I'd like to know like what, what's being done to monitor the quality of teaching and set parameters of instruction and, and just deal with and address all of these things that have yet to be addressed. Um, lastly, for now, I just wanna to touch on um, last, at, the, at the last meeting um, I spoke up and there was a Tap into Wayne article written after that last meeting. Part of a concern I raised that evening was quoted in that article, the quote read, what are we doing about other teachers, not those with valid 504 and protected um, by law to remain virtual, but the others who are not attending school in person because of a COVID exposure. What protocols are in place to follow up on that and ensure their re-entry back into school is done so in the quickest and safest way possible? The article then quoted, Mrs. Kazan's response to my concern saying it was done so with a shake of the head and basically quoting her as viewing it as a ridiculous notion and way off base. I wanted to clear up my concern so the single quote is not taken out of context or misconstrued. What some may not realize is that my questions that evening and in a follow-up email were a direct challenge to the frequently asked questions and answers that were published earlier that same day. That particular frequently asked question went like this. Please advise how is the Board of Ed handling teachers and staff that are unwilling to report to school for their jobs? Dr. Toback's published response was this, and I quote, there are no cases where teachers and staff are unwilling to report to work. However, there are a number of staff members who, have, who are accommodated by law, blah, blah, blah. So I was challenging Dr. Toback's response with a concern, a concern that many parents have identified. Dr. Toback's claim seems to be that every single teacher who is absent or working from home is due to a documented medical reason that is accommodated by law. We know that there are more teachers out than those with 504 plans, so it begs the question, doesn't it? I have the utmost respect for teachers, especially during this unprecedented time. Many are going above and beyond. I recognize that, I applaud that, but teachers are also human. And as humans, we, are all, we all sometimes can act- Mrs. Jaffe, Ms. I'm sorry. <laughs> You Just, can get back in the queue. I will. I will. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's your three minutes. We want to get as many questions as possible. Next. Good evening. Tori Esposito, 47 Woodlot Road in Wayne. Um, the one consideration for the two o'clock win is also to kids uh, go to aftercare. So what about those kids and what are they doing about that? Um, why are we first talking about tents and face shields on March 4th? Why weren't we talking about this in September to get these kids back sooner? Um, and I want to echo Ms. Shear's point about her kid because I've seen such a change in my seven-year-old son now. He loves going back to school. He wants to go do sports now. And I, it just, I, I, 
I can't, it just, his attitude has changed and I love it. Um, again, let's, can we, if we can try to push up the timeline um, and to Mr. Pavlak point about, you know, COVID isn't the only thing killing people, right? They're everything, you know, people have lost their jobs, financial hardships, depression. So COVID is not the only thing that's killing people. Um, Ms. Putup, when will you feel comfortable about wh what number do we need to, to, to get you to feel comfortable? Right. Or, so you want you're proposing a virtual after spring break. Are we going to do the same thing for Memorial Day? Everybody assumes you can't catch COVID in New Jersey. You, but if, if you but if, if, if you leave, if you leave the state, you can catch COVID. You catch COVID in Wayne, in Patterson, in Lyndhurst, in Westwood. You can catch COVID anywhere. So let's not make that an excuse. Get these kids back, back in sooner. Let's not go remote. Um, thank you. OK, thank you. Next. Hi, this is Rebecca Bradley. I'm at 28 Pittman Place in Wayne. Um, first off, I would really like to thank Stacy Sher for her very amazing common sense questions that so eloquently echoed my own, my concerns with this plan that see this plan that seems so arbitrary and, and the very real concerns of parents. These questions, these, these dates that seem to come out of nowhere, these surveys that take weeks and weeks and weeks to get sent. For, for what reason, no one knows. Nobody can point to anything. I have a second, I have a first grader and a fourth grader. And it's wonderful that you guys are proposing flexibility for the students should my, my first grader need to be picked up and my fourth grader need to leave early and be late. However, that doesn't actually work for him, which really is the main concern. How does it affect the students? Not how does it work for the teachers and let's be flexible, but it's one more thing he has to deal with on top of me having to try to explain to him why there's no scientific reason that his sister gets to return to school and he has to continue to endure hybrid. Can't explain that because it's all arbitrary, much like the schools are closed, but you can participate in in-school sports and work out in the weight room, but you can't take gym and touch the same equipment. You guys delineate which side of the pool you're allowed to pee in. Now it is March. My son returned, my kids returned to school last week for the first time in 75 days to a school system that looks nearly identical to what it looked like in September, except now next week they get to go one extra day. You guys are talking about this is phase five. I hate to tell you guys, but this is phase 1B. You've done nothing in the way of being proactive. It's been reactive, as Mr. Esposito pointed out. Where have the, where have the shields been? I haven't heard from the doctor that you guys have hired. Where's the science? I, I applaud your effort to keep things moving forward. But as we heard from Mrs. Putup about preemptive closings, no other places, no businesses, no entities employ this idea that things will happen. We should shut down these blanket closures, which make no sense. I can take hot yoga, but my kids can't sit in school. I urge you. Fill out the surveys now. The numbers will look no different. Why do we have 28 kids in a class? You have seven elementary schools. You have surveys to do, do them now. Figure out your numbers now. Get the kids in school now. You guys are playing catch up. There's 800 and something schools that are open. Every time you talk about Passaic County numbers, you're grouping us in with towns like Patterson that are not on the same stage as Wayne. Our numbers should be Wayne numbers, not Passaic County numbers. I urge you to please, Move the surveys along. Get our kids in school. For those members of the board, Mr. Pavlak, Mrs. Albanese, that are finally speaking sense of things that we've been saying for a year. Mental health is important. These kids need to be in school. The time for silence is over. You guys need to be moving quicker. I am again, I do applaud your effort, but it's a That's little- That's your time, Mrs. Bradley. Thank you. Next. My name is Donna Reaver, and yes, I'm the first vice president of the WEA, but more importantly, I'm an elementary school teacher, and I'm here on behalf of these largely beaten up and worn down educators. A year ago, all we heard was how teachers were heroes. We're done being heroes. Now we're just trying to survive each day. And these new demands presented tonight really just border on abuse. Teaching children during a pandemic absolutely warrants certain requirements to be placed on teachers. How could it not? We're not disputing that. 
but the demands that are continually put on the elementary teachers of this district are unacceptable. It seems like every time we turn the corner, elementary teachers get yet another directive, completely different from the last directive, and we're just supposed to be able to adjust and execute it on a dime. And we have to make it work because the plans were created solely by administrators. And apparently, as Mrs. Reichman said tonight, it was they were also changed after critical consideration on parent input. But the ones who really know, and I mean truly know, what will work in a hybrid classroom are the teachers. They're the experts. Tonight, we're presented with yet another plan, another change that once again adds to the demands of the elementary teacher. And once again, teacher input was overlooked. Oh wait, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't overlooked. It was promised by administration who then turned their back on their promise and on the teachers of our youngest students. The idea of essentially eliminating social distancing in a K to two room was never discussed with a teacher. A teacher who has to yell through two masks now, their desk shield to reach the in-person kid in the back of the room behind their shield, which at that point, let's see if it's still on the desk or on the floor, as well as be heard by the virtual students on the computer. Teachers were not consulted when the win period was put back into the schedule after it went in and then out and in and I'm sorry, I've lost track at this point. I don't have enough time to tell you all that's wrong with the win period. And I won't even get started on the problems of bringing K to two back five days and not three to five. Or the fact that our kindergarten teachers have been under tremendous amounts of pressure trying to make an overlap work for more than six months only to be told that there was an alternate solution all along. Teachers went from heroes to being shown no respect. If it was not evident enough at the last board meeting when half of the board members did not even congratulate the educators of the year, it's surely evident now. I urge you to fix this plan. Have the respect and the good sense to consult the professionals, our teachers who live this day in and day out. This might look simple on paper, but I can assure you it's not and this plan will be a disaster. Thank you. Next. Hello. You need to unmute. Software problem? Okay. Next caller. Hi, Mario Coletti, Seven Berry Drive. Um, first, I would just like to say that um, although there are very good things in this plan, like uh, getting the elementary school kids back in the classroom uh, sooner rather than later, although not soon enough in my opinion, and as well as getting the uh, students with special education needs and IEPs into the classroom five days a week. I do have some questions to start off with regarding the plan. I have to, I mean, really, I don't want to take up too much time with this because Mrs. Sher and Mr. Pavlov kind of uh, pointed these concerns out. I have a second and fifth grader, a fourth grader, excuse me. So the pickup times and the drop off times are going to be very difficult. Um, I don't know what the, you know, with maybe having 10 extra minutes for drop off and pick up as a grace period, like 10 minutes earlier and 10 minutes later for pick up and drop off, for example, might, you know, be reasonable. That way I don't have, we don't have to either cut my son's time short or, you know, quickly run, uh, run out uh, and pick up our daughter while he's still in class. Um, and the other, my other concern is, is why the lag between the two? Um, I don't see why it can't just be done at the same time. Um, we, you know, we'll have the numbers and you should have the numbers soon. I don't believe there's much re uh, reason why not, we can't just have them do both at the same time because that will eliminate a lot of the problems for the parents and the teachers alike um, in that regard. And I just wanted to uh, just uh, to, uh, make a comment on a few things. Um, again, you know, yes, COVID is still a problem and I, and I, I know it is still a problem. But when we're looking at things too, I we just want to echo another, somebody else brought it up too, that Passaic incorporates the entire county and Wayne numbers are actually quite good in, uh, in, in regards to numbers as the mayor has been updating and uh, as we've been getting reports from the state. Um, and 
also with regards to um, going virtual over spring break, I got to strongly suggest not to do that. Um, one of the main reasons is, you know, Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a one-shot vaccine. Teachers are available March 15th. Not really too much of a reason why most teachers can't be back, at least get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine before spring break and be fully uh, vaccinated by that time they get back. And finally, uh, I know there has been some discussion regarding the social distancing, but again, this is also based in science in that the six feet rule is only really supposed to be incorporated when there is no masking or other physical barriers between people. And it is evident by not only the CDC having flexibility, but also the World Health Organization stating that three feet with masking in the schools, especially elementary schools are acceptable standards and do not increase the rate of transmission or outbreaks in the community. And finally, I just wanna end with this, uh, you know, this pandemic, we've all been in it together. I just would like if everybody could stop pointing the figures at this group and this group and that group. Uh, I was very upset with some of the comments made at the last board meeting in regards to a certain group of parents and being irresponsible. We are all in this together. Everybody has the, the opportunity to be responsible or irresponsible and pointing fingers at one group or another is not helpful in any way moving us forward or further along. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, Tara Daly, 53 Osceola Road. Uh, according to Dr. Toback's presentation, more students at the high school level are going virtual. My son's class had a maximum of five students in his cohort. When he is forced to stay home, some of his classes have zero students in them. If by your own admission, the enrollment for in-person is low, why can't the cohorts at the high school level be eliminated? Why are the students that want to be in the building being, mar being marginalized? You keep talking about the students that want to stay home. We know there must be a virtual option, but why is the district allowing changes to instructional choice to be on a rolling basis? Why are we not having parents make the choice for the rest of the year? Respectfully, it is March. Why has this survey not been put, up, put out already? And in conclusion, I would just like to thank Mrs. Shear uh, for her comments today. She, since this has started, um, these meetings back in the summer, she has by far been the most responsive board member. I appreciate Mr. Pavlak also stepping up tonight and Mr. Albanese. Uh, I wanna echo Mr. Coletti's comments about that we've all been in this together. This is the anniversary today of our first COVID case in New Jersey. The adults in the room teachers, board members, administration, parents, we all need to stand up collectively. Our children are watching us and seeing how we behave. Pointing fingers back to Halloween at the last meeting by Mrs. Putup and talking about uh, community behavior, that's not going to get us anywhere. We cannot control people's behavior that we have to stop pointing fingers and talk about a plan that's moving us forward. We know what to do. Wash your hands, wear your masks. That's all we can do. This is a virus and a virus is gonna virus. We have to do our best by our children. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Alan Tempescu, 41 Gibbs Drive. Can you hear me? Yep. I listened uh, to the board uh, last week and at the end, a board member suggested that the current two week notice for a, a board member suggested that maybe the two week notice for a child to return to school be extended to possibly a full marking period. And in the FAQs, it says that for phase five, we're asking parents who are certain to remote, to commit to that for the remains of the year, but also mentions the two week notice provision in the same FAQs. Like a prior caller today, Mr. Ginsburg, I agree. The flexibility afforded to parents with the two week notice provision is viewed by many as a strength. As Dr. Tobek has stated, that places parents in a position to make decisions and do what they see as best for their children. Removal of a two-week notice provision is a takeaway for students, parents, and it actually hurts teachers. 
It takes away flexibility. In fact, Governor Murphy's executive order specifically provides that eligibility for remote learning be, quote, unconditional procedures to return to school. We all want to be in school, but there could be an in-person student who has to become remote by no choice of their own. Why would that child have to wait to return to school when able? Ms. Reichman stated today, and I agree, that we have all taken different journeys and roads, but we all wanna get back to school. There are a host of legitimate reasons why parents need that flexibility, how that helps everyone. Ms. Scherr today said it's ridiculous, the two week provision. I could not disagree more. Remote students may not be able to return on April 19th, but they should not have to wait long periods of time to return. Vaccination timings could be a factor. A student may be not able on April 19th to return due to pre-screening symptoms, or they may be in contact with someone who has COVID. And what about the governor's order that says it's unconditional? Is the governor's order also ridiculous? Was the two-week notice provision that, Ms. Scherr, you voted for for the entire year, was that ridiculous too? I, I respectfully submit that if you change the time frame to a longer period, parents may then return their child to school when not appropriate because they may not want to miss a deadline. And that would not be the best thing to do. I'm certain it will encourage or obligate some parents to make decisions for their child not in alignment with their best interests. Finally, parents, students deserve that flexibility. Placing restrictions in April when the flexibility was there the entire year, that is what is ridiculous. That's your time, Mr. Timpescu. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, this is Lindsay Miller of teacher Anthony Wayne. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, so looking at the plan from the middle school level, I do feel like the longer periods offered by the new schedule are a step forward. I kind of miss the longer periods from that temporary virtual time of 35 minutes. But I'm worried that completely eliminating office hours will be a disservice to many students while we've yet to return fully to normal, especially as long as a significant population remains virtual. That's kind of the main sticking point for me, that significant population. Without office hours, it becomes very difficult to offer students who need it one-to-one -one attention in this, AC, in this kind of simultaneous in-person and virtual instruction. If I'm operating the full virtual meet and speaking to in-person students, there's not really a place in that for one-to-one -one interaction with the virtual students, especially if they're the shyer students who don't wanna have other people listening into the conversation. Um, that can happen in a normal classroom setting where you have small groups, you can be in one corner of the room um, conferring with the student, but not really when you're plugged into the computer. It's suggested that after school initiatives might be able to replace office hours, but I don't think it really effectively can. This would require students to extend their screen time and school day when they might have other commitments. Um, I and many teachers are already putting in extra hours of planning and even providing after school support to students during a typical week. And I really don't know how much energy and time I have to step that up further. Um, teachers are human and have limits, um, and some of them already have after-school commitments, as I do, to extracurriculars, academic support pro programs, and their own families. While extra money may entice some to staff after-school initiatives, there are limits. And the plan to meet all student needs shouldn't require that component. There needs to be something in the day to get that interaction for individual uh, virtual students. I almost think that something more akin to the 35 minute periods with a shorter office hour period might work to reach a, a kind of compromise position here for both groups. But I don't, I don't necessarily think that should be permanent, but just feels necessary to be equitable to all groups as long as there's that significant virtual population. I have many students who depend on office hours to get reassurance, check in, or simply connect with another human. Some have come to see me just to, to talk about their projects, their family struggles with COVID, and I think they'd panic having that taken away in some of their cases because they aren't really students who are vocal in the whole class meet. 
by the time the schedule is implemented, I expect I'll be vaccinated. I'm not thinking of this in terms of lowering my contact time with kids. My students, for the large part, I expect will not be. There's still a health risk for them and their families. And I feel that in order to give an equitable virtual option, we still need the, some sort of time built into the school day uh, for those students to get that small group and one-to-one -one support. Um, thank you for your attention. I know the plan's complicated with all these parts uh, and I appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you, perfect timing. <laughs> Next caller. Hi, Donna Del Mara, Wayne Hills English teacher. Um, my concerns for the phase five opening plan are as follows, but I would like first if you could confirm as well that the district will allow teachers to participate in this survey. Thanks to the administration for creating plans in this ever changing, confusing situation. Can be seen. So here are my clocks of virtual coming back for in no possible way students return. Have you can teachers must hybrid value added for increasing Consider a 10 day break as we loosen students will still be residents who waited will do as well. Double masking in February and May and masking has its during office hours times a day specifically torturous. Who will super take off their give me a little bit of office hours allotted for same mask. teaching five periods and students time to consult with especially stand with many of them in last September. You have schedules in person learn the red zone asked us to give up or did. The Texas and, and here are about the fourth working period, all of us, and that many other did postpone such a move to one year and, and have a great night. Next. Also, I want to thank you guys because you guys have a really secure plan. Like It's really solid. And I really appreciate the COVID updates at board meetings. Um, so, and also sorry about all the parents. Um, now that if you, now if you just uh, listen to the teacher's concerns and utilize their input, that'd be perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Don't go to the library and look for me. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Eileen D'Amigo, 29 Manor Drive. Um, I actually had a bunch of questions tonight, but apparently, uh, like many others, Mrs. Shear is channeling a number of us tonight. So all I'll say for most of my questions was ditto to everything she said, especially with her comments to re and requests to accelerate this process. Um, and not continue to wait and kick the can down the road to get things moving forward. Um, I also have a similar thought to those of Mr. Esposito earlier with regard to travel. And I'm wondering if there is some data that's being utilized when we are making decisions whether or not to um, go to more in person and move forward that says that you're more likely to get COVID from some other state versus right here in our lovely state of New Jersey. Um, last I checked, we have one of the worst case counts overall in the country, so I'm not really sure what the big concern is there. You can get COVID here just as easily as you can get it anywhere else. Um, the other thing with regard to high schools and noticing that a larger number, it seems, have elected to go virtual versus hybrid, I'm just curious if any effort has been made to talk to the high school students you know, via some sort of communication method and or their parents to find out why they're electing to do so. Um, I know I've spoken to a number, especially of seniors at Wayne Hills, where my son attends for other reasons. And I think some of those conversations might be enlightening. So just might be worth looking into if there's an opportunity to do that. Um, and then last, uh, with regard to some of the comments, I think it was by Mr. Tempescu and maybe some of the others, I'm a little bit confused. I thought what Mrs. Shear was suggesting earlier, which I agree with actually, is having parents commit to virtual if they're going to do so through the end of the year. But obviously if you choose hybrid and then your child needs to quarantine or get sick, God forbid, or some other thing that would put them out for a period of time, they would then be allowed to return to the hybrid if that were their choice. I thought that was sort of the plan we were moving toward. And what she was simply suggesting was if you're choosing to have your child stay virtual at this point, and they're healthy and there's no other reason just for whatever reason you're choosing to keep them virtual that you commit to that through the end of the year. Um, I just want clarification to make sure I'm understanding correctly that that's the direction that's being proposed. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Next caller. You could star nine when you're on the phone to unmute. Are you there? Next 
Next caller. Hi, this is Catherine Rich, 57 Ellicott Lane in Wayne. I just wanted to say thank you to Stacy Shear for standing up for the parents of this community, Mrs. Albanese, Dr. Pavlak. I have lived in this town for 39 years and I appreciate all the support and I'm not gonna repeat anything that Mrs. Shear said because those are all my sentiments. So thank you, we need to get on the right direction. Thank you. Next. Hi, um, Amanda Morgan. I'm a teacher at Wayne Hills High School. Um, I just want to, I said, actually, I just have a few questions. Uh, with regards to the high school schedule, the passing times have been shortened, um, but with one way hallways and also needing to clean, if we cut back down from eight minutes back down to four minutes, we're actually cutting into instructional times. So we have to stop early so that we can clean. Um, our desks and all that. Um, also the elimination of office hours. Um, I feel like it's taking away from the virtual students. There was a mention about academic support after school. Will that be a stipend position or will that be um, just on teachers to give extra help after contractual hours? And last thing about virtual after spring break, I know many, many of my students are going away out of state. And I just feel like instead of, you know, the caller mentioned about being reactive versus proactive, I feel like maybe going virtual even just for a week is going to be um, us being proactive as a district. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Julia Hilgi Dardia, 87 Poplar. I have been outspoken in favor of full day kindergarten for six very long years. And I've also been at these planning meetings before where it was included in the preliminary budget and then taken away. It looks promising that you will finally get it over the finish line this time. And I want to encourage you to commit yourself to making it happen. And thank you in advance for continuing that commitment, even in the face of COVID. Please don't forget the long and twisted road that has led us to this point. Additionally, while I no longer have a kindergartner, I think it's shameful how little school time they're getting this year. When we move to five days, have you considered bringing back KRAP for the end of the school year? Historically, that program has been very popular and a money maker. Half a day wasn't enough, so less than half a day is abysmal. We will spend the next few years helping these kids catch up. I encourage you to do everything you can to improve the school experience for our kindergartners. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Star nine to unmute. Am I correct on that, Dr. Bouchard? Yes. Okay. It's star six to unmute, star nine to raise your hand. Ah, star six. See, I was wrong. Sorry. You want to try star six? Okay. Next caller. Wait. Hello. There. Oh, there you are. Okay. Hi guys. Uh, we can hear you. From 30, calling from 30 plus. Just getting one, one point. What about those students that actually are look, are being taught in a virtual manner? What are the, the learning um, tests that we're doing for them? And what are these um, situations with grading logistics? I my kid is in middle school and um, there's certain situations and with teachers are giving him, um, you know, the understanding of the fact of, that this is very hard for a middle schooler and any other student. Um, the time, sometimes things may be late, maybe submitted in the same day, where there are other teachers that are actually being on point and disregarding that the kid may be sick, maybe having um, migraines, this is one thing that is being observed for students who are on chronic now and virtual, that they are getting these um, triggers of having migraines. Um, what, are, what are these new logistics? I think we should also be focusing on how these, uh, the kids are being graded and whether it's virtual or live specifically in terms of how they're being managed in the technology aspect. Um, the other um, 
the other question or the other comment, I would like to comment that person that called it in about the teachers. They need their rep time. I myself am an educator and it's, I, I feel like I work in double. I don't work for Wayne, but I do work for another district. And I stay up until like 10, 11 p.m. trying to kind of meet all these different guidelines to make sure that each other and my kids are actually learning, finding different ways because it's a different scenario teaching through a computer. And it is our responsibility to make sure that we're teaching our kids uh, what they need. I know there's so many challenges. Um, let's give some credit to our teachers. And I really, really are very proud of our teachers in Wayne. I know they're, they're pushing our kids, whether they're virtual life. I could see it from my kid, he's being pushed. Well, I would say a little to teachers need to little be a little bit understanding, and there has been. Um, but um, I'm I'm just let's just give credit to the teachers. You know, they 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 are the heroes. Aside from doctors and nurses, they are the heroes. So let's not forget this. I know we want our kids back at school as much as I would love. To, I love my kid, but I'm following the science, and the science says what the science says. Wear your mask. Okay, and be careful. My son is um, asthmatic, so I'm being careful. He's going to be full blown on virtual. But um, I'm I'm commending to that's your time, ma'am. I'm sorry okay. to interrupt. Thank you for your call. Next caller. Hi, this is Maria Pranzo, 14 Chicopee Drive. Um, first, I wanted to um, say thank you to all of the board members and the administration and for to all of the teachers who have done you know an incredible job in in very trying times um i know this is you know something that you never could have anticipated um you know to to have to teach in an environment like this but you know thank you for all you're doing every day um <clears throat> I, I have two two issues to bring up um first is that I strongly disagree with requiring parents to commit to an all virtual, um, you know, uh, course of learning for the remainder of the year or for parents to have to commit to any kind of learning for, you know, schedule for, a, 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 you know, a duration of time or an extended period of time. This is, this is, it. we're in a pandemic. This is a, a virus, um, you know, situations change on uh, in the, on the drop of a hat and it's it's not right to penalize kids who might otherwise want to be in school um but now they're forced to uh because of some arbitrary guideline to not have that opportunity um i unfortunately have a situation where i have uh, immunocompromised family in the house and you know we've been trying to get the vaccine for them we we're finally able to schedule uh, and get a vaccine next week. It will take a little time for the Im immune, uh, immunity to take effect, but I'm looking forward to the time where my daughter is able to go to school again. Um, and I'm sure other families are in the same situation where they, you know, absent, absent of, um, you know, having situations like that in their home would have their children in school. Um, I, I think that we're trying to cater to, um, a group of people who are very vocal and, and, and upset because they want their kids to, they, they think that by forcing people to choose, there will be more people that, you know, either choose to be in school. Um, and that's not right for people who truly want to be there, but are waiting for the ability to get a vaccine. Um, and, and most people aren't even eligible for a vaccine yet. So let's keep that in mind. Um, teachers aren't even eligible for a vaccine until the 15th. So, you know, I just want to throw that out there. Um, so I, I strongly disagree with requiring um, families to have to choose uh, and, and make it an extended period of time that they can't, they can't change their options. Um, everything's changing and, and we need to be flexible. And that's what the, right, the, the law requires too, that we be flexible. Um, secondly, I know there was discussion about children's social and emotional issues and and certainly they've been through a tremendous amount this year so many have um you know not had the opportunities that others before them have had and um i just want to 
you know, throw this out there. Are we considering um, sort of making up maybe next year some of the fun, uh, you know, fun activities that they might otherwise have had this okay. year? Okay, ma'am, I'm sorry. Sorry That's to okay. interrupt. Thank it's you. Your time. Thank, Thank you. Much. Next. Star six <laughs> to unmute. It's laugh at Kathy night. It's okay. Enjoy it. You're on. Hello. Are you there? Hello. Next caller. Almost had him. Hi, this is Kim Woodhour from uh, 15 Andover Drive. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, I wanted to, first of all, again, as um, so many have done, I want to thank, thank Mrs. Cher and Mrs. Albanese and Mr. Pavlak for the sentiment earlier, uh, so many people are, are, are really appreciating what, what they have said. Um, and I, I do as well, um, you know, just to reiterate the fact that we are not accelerating the process to move things along and have these decisions made earlier is just extremely surprising. Um, so many people have called and said that they want flexibility, but I just don't uh, think they understand that with the flexibility they're asking for, the school will never be able to commit to a plan. So I think people need to understand where, you know, you, you have to have, you have to commit, we have to have a plan. And I, I fully would support uh, changing every quarterly or, you know, every two months, but the idea that it's completely open, I, I just, I don't understand where, how that's rational. Uh, just a couple questions that I had. Um, as was on the screen, Pennsylvania has removed their travel restrictions. So I'm wondering when Wayne will be looking to do the same thing. My second question is, uh, why are the playgrounds still closed? The sports have been open pretty much this entire time. They're sharing equipment, they're sharing balls for sports, but yet elementary school playgrounds are closed. Yet you can go across the street to Greenvale and there are playgrounds open there. So. I'm not understanding the rationale with that. And then the third question I have is with whatever new program we have, will there be an aftercare uh, program? And if we have it, will kids be able to socialize in it? I have a second grader myself. He was in the aftercare program at the beginning of last year and they were not allowed to socialize. So uh, I immediately pulled him out. I would love to use those services, but if uh, the kids can't socialize with each other, it, it doesn't really make any sense. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next. Where'd they go? Next. Hello, unmute. Can you unmute? Next caller, Dr. Bouchard. Hi, Amy Nazarko, 91 Chestnut Drive. Um, as a parent in the district, I'm just going to say I understand how important school is for elementary school children and middle school children. Those are the ages of my children. And I'm also a teacher at the high school. So I know how important it is for teens. I know how important it is to be in school, um, but we're still in a pandemic. I wish we weren't. I wish I could change that, but that's just a fact. And I have some worries about the plan that you're proposing. Um, my first worry, like a lot of the teachers is, I have no idea how office hours are gonna work with the full day. Um, I was wondering if somebody can elaborate on that. I have so many obligations after school that I'm barely making as it is, and I just don't see how I can spend um, any more time at school after 2.30. It just won't work. My parents are stretched thin watching my kids as it is. 
I, I just can't ask them to do anymore. Um, many other teachers have family obligations, elderly parents, children, um, you know, other jobs to make ends meet. And I just don't see how they're gonna fit in this extra work after hours. Um, I also wanna address the high school lunch hours. There is no set cafeteria at this point in time. You know, we need to wipe down, clean off tables, clean off chairs, things like that. And I'm just concerned about the massless students that do not have a permanent place to go and be safe. They don't have permanent chairs. They don't have a specific spot. In my classroom, they have a chair. They know their chair. They come in, they take a wipe, they wipe it down, they make it safe. They won't have that. And I'm just wondering how that will work. And also who will monitor students and their masks when they are eating versus not eating in the hour long lunch. Um, finally, longer days just means longer screen time. My kids are already, my, my own personal children, are sick of computers. They're just sick of them. They don't wanna be on the screen any longer than they have to be. Um, I see this as a teacher and a parent, and I just wonder how we're gonna address screen time because there are still kids who will be completely virtual. Um, and finally, just a few people were talking about teachers being vaccinated by April 19th. And frankly, I unless the town steps in and helps that to happen, I don't see how that's gonna happen. I'm not saying that the town should step in. I just, just I cannot wrap my brain around how that's gonna happen. Moderna is a full four weeks between doses and then another two weeks for it to take effect. And we can't even sign up for um, vaccination appointments until March 15th. Plus finding an actual vaccination appointment is very difficult to put it mildly. I've been looking for my elderly relatives. It, I've been doing it for hours after school in addition to everything else that I do as a parent. Um, so those are my thoughts. I'm just, those are my questions. Have a great day. Thank you. Next. Hello. Go ahead. Hi, um, this is Jody Trebasian, 37 Smith Lane. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Board of Education for releasing the plan, uh, Dr. Toback, um, in time for us to review it, formulate questions, be able to send emails, um, suggestions, and comment on the plan itself. Um, that's very helpful, and I'd like to thank you for that. Number two, I'd like to thank the board members for actually speaking their opinions today. I think that was wonderful for us to hear actually what you're thinking, if in support or not in support. I think every board member should come out and actually speak about what they're feeling right now. You know, it is very important now for us to come together as a community and push together for our children to do what's right for the students, the teachers, and everyone in this community. COVID has been a nightmare for everyone, but it is time to move forward. Thank goodness we are in a better position to say these things, okay? I have concerns with the plan. Um, I think that there's some positives in it as well. Um, I know a lot of time went into it, um, but I do think that people are frustrated because there's this lag time where we could just be a more proactive in sending out surveys possibly earlier to get feedback, get actual numbers and be able to make appropriate decisions, okay? That makes a difference, okay? I don't understand what the difference between snack and lunches in the elementary schools. I don't understand how my child can sit in a lunchroom now or an art room, have a snack, okay, but can't then finish the entire day with a lunch. It makes no sense to me. So I'd really like someone to explain that to me, the rationale for that, why our children can't have a full day of school in person because they can't eat in the classroom or they can't eat a full lunch. I'm just confused to that. Um, regarding uh, quarantining over spring break, um, you know, we all have to have personal responsibility in this. I don't think that people who don't travel should be penalized and not have their children attend school for others that have the right to go on vacation. <laughs> we have these rights, okay? If we want us to quarantine, if that's the rule of the district, which I think we should post, and I'm not sure if that's out, what you are requiring right now, that needs to be stated and we will follow it. But to penalize an entire system for a spring break that people are entitled to does not make any sense. Okay. Um, I know people are frustrated. I know the board is frustrated. Parents are frustrated. Uh, people are impatient. And yes, we are impatient because we just want 
rationales provided for the decisions that are being made. April 19th, please tell me why that date was created. Why can't tomorrow my children have a full day of school? I appreciate your time. Thank you for all you're doing. We appreciate the teachers and all they are doing as well. Thank you Thank very you. much. That's your time. Okay. Next. Hi, this is Jenny Franklin, 21 Keylana Drive. Um, at last week's board meeting, um, a supposedly small group of parents were chastised for being impatient with the progress that the administration and the Board of Ed have made in getting the kids back to full-time school. As part of that small group of parents, which actually number in the thousands, I felt that that was not fair to us. When we started the 2020-21 school year, we were told that our children would be on a hybrid schedule in the fall, and then as time and the pandemic allowed, they would hopefully be moved to full time. Last week, my high schooler went to school for three days in one week, which was amazing for him. That successful week of school was his 10th, 11th, and 12th day of in-person school this entire year. And he has gone every day his cohort was allowed. He has not missed any time. When you do the math and compare hours in school for this year versus hours in school for a normal year, for the first 105 days, the high school students of Wayne have been present in school 8% of the hours they normally would be. 8%. We are not impatient, we are frustrated, we are disappointed, and we are so, so eager for progress to take place more quickly. So many high schoolers have decided to remain virtual. Your presentation and your numbers support that tonight, and there's more going virtual than the other way around. That's their choice. This has left empty, high, empty classrooms at the high school level. Let the kids who wanna go to school be in school every day. Combine the cohorts. The other issue I would like to discuss, which no one has mentioned tonight, but I think it bears mentioning is regarding senior activities. I know that the school administration is in the process of planning the end of the year events for, high, for both high schools. And I trust that they will do everything they can to make those events wonderful for our kids. My request to you is this, please do everything possible to make sure that these events, award ceremonies, scholarship nights, graduations, or in-person events. After a year of this virtual, the kids can't take any more. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great, this is E.B. Wenting, 7 Seminole Ave. Um, thank you, uh, the board and everyone involved for putting the plan together. I really appreciate your time. I echo all the parents' sentiment with Stacy Cher looking up for the children and her wonderful comments, Mr. Pavlak and Miss Albanese as well. So thank you so much. I heard a whole bunch of teachers calling in and they were concerned about the office hours. So I wonder if survey can be asked of parents, how many times their children participated in office hours and also ask the teachers, how many times do they, how much time do they spend on the office hours? So I have three children. My middle schooler never took up uh, any office hours and my first grader did maybe two or three times we reached out to the teacher and my high schooler two times that I can remember. Um, so I'm just curious, what did those numbers look like to make sure that you know, we're not taking anything away or I, I just, I can't imagine because in my house, it doesn't look like that much time spent on office hours is needed, but I may be wrong. So I um, would see, you know, what would wanted to know if we can find that out. So that would be great. Um, that's my only comment. I believe a lot of the parents had some great comments. My all school children want to go in school and be in person. Actually, what happened is with the cohort C, my son went in by mistake and then was sent home just because we he missed the day on a Thursday and he went in on Tuesday because he's so excited and going in high school. So if you can get those kids to school sooner rather than later, um, we in our house definitely greatly appreciate it. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly your child agrees. Next caller.
Good Hello? evening. Yes, good evening. Hi, my name is Kathleen Statil. I'm a teacher from Pines Lake School. Uh, I want to thank all of you, first of all, for your patience and your hard work. Um, it is a thankless task. And as I've said on previous times when I've called in, nobody knows what it's like in somebody else's shoes unless you walk a mile in their shoes. And I think that that's true of your positions as it is of teachers' positions, parents' positions as well. Um, so my question is this, going with this new plan, were any elementary teachers involved in the design of the phase, the next lot of the phase? And not only elementary teachers, but were there other disciplines included like BISOP, ESL, reading specialists? There are so many moving parts in a building that people just can't think of all of them at one time or in one meeting. So were all of these different disciplines can, consulted prior to the development of this plan? Um, the wind period. I, I, I don't even really have words for the wind period and the confusion that it has caused for teachers and parents alike. When office hours, what is it really? And what are you making it to be? Because parents are confused, teachers are confused. So if it was supposed to be the wind period during just virtual days, okay, I got that. And that's where teachers have to plan. There's way more planning involved in that. It's not just semantics. Um, so is it something that the teachers have to plan? But then we were supposed to go back to office hours when we were back to school. But now it's a win period. And within that win period, there's social emotional learning, there's reading specialists, there's BISIP, there's instrumental music. What is it? And who's attending? Because parents are confused. They think their kids should be on every day from 2 to 2.45. But guess what? The teacher didn't dismiss the kids. They didn't all get picked up until 1.05. And then the teacher has the nerve to have to use the bathroom and stand online waiting for the bathroom prior to getting back into their classroom to get the kids back on the screen for more screen time. I think there needs to be a lot more discussion about what that's supposed to look like so parents are clear and teachers are clear. And it really should not, it should be more flexible group time and not so much of a planned time that it sometimes appears to be. And how could we not consider being virtual after spring break? How is a principal supposed to staff a building? I know that that hasn't come, to, come up when people speak about it and get angry about how could we go virtual, but really the staffing is going to be a huge issue and that needs to be um, a consideration. And snack and lunch, I, I totally get it. And I'm curious, has anybody walked through a building when children are eating and seen how many kids and how close together they are without a mask? Or have you walked through a building and seen the cohorts already, the one first grade that has 15 kids in it with their backpacks everywhere and the desk shields and that before all the cohorts are combined? It's tight. And those, I think I saw Ms. Reichman get that. Um, That's your face time, ma'am. I'm sorry. Thank I'm you. Sorry. It's okay. Thank you. Okay. Can I get a mover? That's our last caller, Mr. Pavlak, Mr. Giordano. Okay. Thank you to all the callers. Certainly there will be a lot to address in the upcoming FAQ. Committee reports. Mrs. Scher. Uh, tonight, the technology committee met. It was myself, Mr. Bubba, Mr. Duffy, Dr. Burchard, and Mr. Blanchard. Um, and it was, we were given a safety update on the district. So I'm not really gonna share too much of that. Thank you. This evening, the Finance Committee met, and um, Mrs. Kazan, Mr. Pavlak, and myself were in attendance along with Mr. Moffitt, our business administrator, and Ms. Leidig, who is the assistant business administrator. Um, I'll make this very brief since the main portion, which is the budget for the coming year, was prevented, presented very nicely by Mr. Moffitt earlier 
in the meeting. Uh, we went over the usual school funds report, contract for professional development, the check register, um, and uh, remaining bond items uh, for Anthony Wayne Middle School and um, bus service, special services, health services. And it was a very productive meeting and we have a budget that we're working on. Kudos to administration in the business office. Thank you. Any other committee reports this evening? Okay, let's move on to the agenda. I get a mover, Mr. Madam Pavlak. I would move the whole agenda as one item. Okay, can I get a second? Mr. Giordano. Any discussion on the agenda items? Okay. Roll call, Mr. Moffat. Mrs. Albanese. Under T, Emergent Human Resources, item number 10, line number two, no, yes to the rest. Mr. Bubba. Under T, Emergent Items, number 10, no to number two, yes to the rest. Mr. Duffy, is he here? He was a moment. Okay, I do not see him. What? Mr. Giordano? Under uh, T Emergent uh, Human Resources, item 10, line two, the vote is no. Everything else is yes. Mrs. Kumar? Yes. Mr. Pavlak? Uh, under T Emergent item number 10, no to number two, yes to everything else. Mrs. Putup? Yes. Mrs. Shear? Yes. Mrs. Kazan? Mr. Duffy is trying to reach you. Um, I'm a yes. I, I, is he calling? Well, he was going to try because he had to go out on a call, but he wanted to vote on the agenda. Do you have his number? He's texting me because he had to run out on a call, so he left his computer. So, so am I to understand to call? You would like me to reach out and call him? I'm trying him. You there? Here. Here, I'll give you to Mr. Moffat. Okay. Thank you. Be safe out there. All motions passed. Mr. Duffy is at the firehouse. You need to go save lives. Motion carries. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, we'll move on to our second public portion. This portion of the meeting is open to citizens for comment on any topic. Residents are to state their names, addresses, and subject matter. Comments may be limited to five minutes per person. Members of the public are discouraged from speaking negatively about an employee or a student. The board bears no responsibility for comments made by the public. Comments regarding employees or students cannot be legally responded to by the board. Other comments may be responded to tonight or at subsequent meetings under old business. Can I get a mover? Mr. Giordano, Mrs. Scher. Star six <laughs> to unmute.
still no luck. Next caller. Hi, Cindy Jaffe, 10 Sherwood Street again. Um, I just want to uh, continue on my point from earlier. Sorry to beat a dead horse, but I have not gotten any answers from my emails or my last time speaking, so I just keep asking the same questions. Um, back to what I asked about getting teachers who are out because of COVID exposure um, back into the schools, like what are we doing to get them back in? And um, I just, I keep asking that because we keep hearing about for months and months how staffing is an issue and it's interfering with our children's full return to school in person. We're paying subs 200 and $225 a day. We know about the number of teachers with medical conditions that are protected by law and nobody is denying them that for certain. But I do think the concern we have is a valid concern to ask about the number of others and what we're doing and how we're getting them back as quickly and as safely as possible to minimize the in-school teacher absences whenever and however we can. I also wanted to give you, Mrs. Kazan, an opportunity to clarify how you felt about that concern because I feel that maybe your response at the meeting was misconstru misconstrued by some, entirely up to you. Um, but again, this is just one of many questions that I've had in regards to the problems that exist with the current hybrid in-person and virtual learning model. And again, I have asked, I have outlined all the concerns I have. I really, really am begging somebody to answer to those concerns um, because we want our kids, our high school kids, especially back in the school. But if there's no motivation to get them back, they're not gonna go back. <laughs> and I agree with the reasons that they don't wanna be back. The technical issues, um, actually that's virtual. Let me start with hybrid. The lack of any social benefit whatsoever, even, you know, even going to two cohorts, they're still sitting in class right now with two to four kids. Um, we're getting into spring, but in the meantime, it's been absolutely freezing because the windows are still being open. I still don't understand why that's the case. Um, and the lack of an educational benefit to sitting in class, the teacher, the teachers themselves are telling you how hard it is. They, they have to sit there and they're taking most of the time taking attendance. And then there's just such little time left to teach. So what can be done about this? And what is going to be done about this? There's, there's I, I just don't know what more I can ask um, or how much more I can beg for you to address these issues. Um, the kids who are in school also are not getting the advantage. Some of the advantages, like it or not, that virtual students at home are getting. They're doing things like as a group effort that are supposed to be independent work. But guess what? They're talking to each other and they're doing it together. They're doing the same thing with assessments. Nobody wants to admit it. You all don't really want to admit it. But guess what? It's happening. So there's an advantage to being virtual. The kids know it. The parents know it. And I want to believe that everyone else knows it. So what are you going to do about it so that the time again, Mrs. Jaffe, to go in I'm person? sorry. Okay, please respond. <laughs> Thank you. Next. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I'm Katie Cluck from 34 Hillcrest Drive. Um, I just wanted to address, uh, I saw recently that Pascac Valley and Hills are changing their racially insensitive mascots. Um, with, and I know we're looking at our diversity, equity, inclusion uh, program and our our goal. And I was wondering if maybe uh, like uh, the, the committees have considered getting in contact with them, seeing how they did it. Uh, I, I think that might be beneficial. Um, I was also wondering, um, I know that the diversity, equity, and inclusion goal was a year-long goal, so I know it's going to take a long time. I was wondering if there has been any consideration to make it an ongoing goal um, and to, like, continue doing implicit bias trainings, to continue, like, just continuously looking and updating and making sure thing, um, the curriculum is both up-to-date and um, 
sensitive to racial issues as well as making sure it's inclusive and accurate. Um, I, there, the systems and the issues in place right now have 400 years of colonization, slavery, and history behind them. So it's going to take a lot of time and effort to undo all of that. So I was wondering um, if consideration to make it ongoing has been made. Thank you so much for uh, all the board has been doing. The, uh, power, uh, the PowerPoints and the presentations uh, are kind of what keep me updated on what's going on in town with COVID. So I just really want to thank you for all of your hard work, and I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Okay, next. Tori Esposito, 47 Woodlot Road. Um, I'm confused. Why would staffing be an issue after spring break? Um, I think that um, if we had to use five emergency days, we wouldn't have a spring break that we'd have to go to school. And I think isn't te aren't teachers told that they can't plan any vacation time during spring break? Um, or is it that the staff in the schools are planning to leave the state when the parents were just scolded for doing that as well? Um, and then mass, as far as I'm concerned, aren't going to, they're still going to be there in September. So I think just hearing and talking with the masks on, like my kid would rather do that and sit in a classroom than sit in front of a computer. So I just, that, that point keeps coming up. It's just a, it's just a moot point at this point. Um, and then, you know, I, you, you hear all the teachers calling about having to pivot and change direction. Welcome to, welcome to a working family. Some, some teachers I called in that had parents very lucky to have parents to watch their kids. Some, some families don't have that. So just be grateful that you have somebody because other families are scrambling and also holding down a full-time job where they can get fired any second of any day. Um, and there goes your entire, there goes, forget, forget a COVID that that's going to be a financial death. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Christ. Hot mic. <laughs> Hi, Alan Tempescu, 41 Gibbs Drive. I'd like to follow up on my support of kids returning to school, but opposing a suggestion to take away a strength in the Wayne program, which gives students and parents flexibility with the two week notice provision in what are very difficult times. Some scenarios to consider. What if a student comes back to school on April 19th and for some reason, on April 23rd, needs to be, become remote, let's say because they came in contact with someone who had COVID. They will be blocked from in-person schooling for the entire year. Another scenario, what if a parent gets vaccinated on April 10th, wants to do the right thing for their family and wait the three weeks for the vaccination to take effect? They miss the April 19th deadline, but wants, wants to come back to school in late April. They have to wait until the entire school year to return to school. I heard a prior caller named Maria correctly state that family situations are changing, that, is it, that it is not right to penalize kids. Some may be truly waiting for a vaccine in their family and that she's in strongly disagreed with extending the two week notice provision that you currently have in place. And I heard another caller earlier today say the same thing. And in fact, Dr. Toback, I agree with you. You've written to me that this flexibility places parents in a position to make decisions and do what they see as best for their children. So in April, we're going to take away that right, that provision, right before the end of the school year. Is that what we're talking about here? And I, again, bring up the executive order of Governor Murphy, which one board member shook her head when I said, is that ridiculous? You know, the governor in his executive order said specifically that it needs to be unconditional but we're going to make our students wait to June to return to wait for the entire school year to pass before returning. I think that's unfair. And I think the strength of the Wayne school system program right now is in place. It's worked for the entire year and it should not change. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next caller. Last time, star six. You there? Hello? Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry. Oh, I've been it's trying okay. so hard. I can't get through. I'm just oh, calling on my cell phone, so there. I can't see. Okay. All right. <laughs> my name is Danielle Piano, and most of you know my name already from, you know, sending emails in about the special needs students. I just want to, um, first of all, thank my son's teachers for all the hard work that they've done this year, especially Mr. Hagen for giving 110% every day. She even when she's frustrated trying to get through her IEP classes, she tried harder with tried harder every day and had patience and had a smile on her face. I've been advocating for my son and his classmates who have had IEPs in math and ELA since August. I've been trying to get them in. And every time that I've asked, I've been told we can't mix the cohorts. They can't go in. And they're just a small group of kids in each grade. Um, yesterday, I was very happy to see, even though I made the mistake because I didn't know what OCR was, and I said so you, um, I sent an email saying you ignored them again, but then I um, made the mistake I didn't know what OCR was, so I apologize for sending that email. Um, but, you know, it's great that the kids, um, kindergarten through fifth grade, are going to be able to get this service. And I'm very happy, you know, my son's in fifth grade and I'm very happy he's going to get this. But I couldn't be happy fully yesterday because you left out sixth through 12th grade. What about these children that have IEPs? I mean, don't they matter? I mean, there's only a few of them in each grade level. And I see that middle school, you're not letting them back in five days and high school either. So, you know, I want to be happy for my son, but I still want to help try to get them in five days. These children have learning disabilities. I mean, they should be the first in. Every town that's open or has, that has had school open from the beginning has had these children in. And I don't understand, in this town, I, I grew up here, I went to public school here, I came back after I got married and to have children and to have my son go to a great school system. And it's just been a fight from day one for special needs students. And, you know, he's in fifth grade already, and I just find that very shameful. This is a very great, terrific school system, and it seems like these kids with special ed or IEPs are always left out. And I don't see no plan for sixth through twelfth grade, so I'm just calling in to advocate for them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Next caller. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. Uh, Leslie Iapolo, 39 uh, Knox Terrace. I'm calling on behalf of the IEP kids as well. Um, I'm very happy that the K through five get to go. Um, I want to say I have two children, sixth and seventh grade. They're both at Anthony Wayne Middle School. I adore all of their teachers. They have been more than accommodating throughout this entire process. My seventh grader is actually the one with the IEP. My sixth grader is in the process of actually being classified. His teachers have gone above and beyond to accommodate any assignment. They've made themselves available to me. Um, countless emails, phone calls, even text messages, um, uh, offering office hours. But my children for the first time this week got to go to school for three days and they were ecstatic. They came home, they were happy that they can complete their work in school, that they can interact with their teachers and just say how much easier it was for them to be in the classroom. So I'm asking to get the IEP kids in five days a week. It would be beyond helpful, um, especially in a home with two working parents that are really trying to make this work. It's very, very difficult working 40 hours a week, and then coming home, doing hours of schoolwork, catching kids up. I'm more than happy to do it. But 
more has to be done to get my son back in school five days a week. He was so happy this week, both of them, that they can complete their work on time, get to work with their teachers. And it would just mean the world if they can get back. Um, I know the teachers are doing everything they can and I appreciate all of them and the board for trying to work through all this. It's not easy. It's not easy on the parents either. I'm sure it's not easy on the teachers. Um, but I just want to say, please uh, keep fighting for the kids with IEPs. They're really struggling. Thank you. Madam President, seeing no one else going to talk. Mrs. Chair, Mrs. Chair can I get a second? Mr. Giordano, you are the motion man of the night. You win. <laughs> okay. Old business. Is this old business or board comments? New business. Board comments. Mrs. Share. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify something for Mr. Tempescu. Um, I hope I'm saying that right. I'm not asking for you to make a decision for your kid to never come back to school. I'm asking for there to be a little more of a time frame because I understand that as a parent, you might enjoy the freedom of having every two weeks to make this decision but it makes it very difficult on administration, on teachers. Um, and I, I, I did shake my head at the governor's executive orders. That It's not a law, it's an executive order. And yeah, there are some things in government that I do shake my head at and I don't agree with. I'm entitled to do that. Um, I, and, and just to clarify, if you choose to go to school and then your kid comes in contact with someone with COVID or God forbid gets COVID, of course they're allowed to, they have to go home and quarantine for two weeks. That's not taking their spot away. That's not someone making a decision. That's something that they have to do. And when their two weeks is over, they'll come back because they chose to be an in-school student. So that example I, that you keep giving doesn't really work for me. Um, and again, you know that I answer every email I get. So please feel free to email me if you have any other concerns about how I'm feeling on the board. That being said, I do try and answer every single email. So I hope that people are getting my responses. Um, there is information that I obviously can't share, but you, the public also has to realize that it's a, it's a catch 22. There's no winning here. So I do try and answer every email, but then I know that this week on social media, there was a parent who was making fun of me for answering and not giving a good enough answer. So I'm just asking everybody to, again, I've asked before to please keep an open mind because we are also, board members are also working full-time jobs. I am a virtual teacher. I'm sure you saw me standing up. I am a virtual teacher myself who has been in a chair and on a computer since 7.30 this morning. So when I'm done with all that, I do try and answer all your emails and I, I, do appreciate all the thank you emails that I get for making the time. But as an elected official, I feel like that's something that I should be doing. So everybody have a wonderful evening. And thank you for your comments. And thank you to administration for all the hard work on everything. <laughs>
and an FAQ will be updated next week. But I'd like to address a few things. Um, as far as board members commenting, I just want you to know that board members advocate all the time behind the scenes. We sit in committee meetings. We fight hard for you. Uh, we discuss these things at length before we even get here. So if we're not necessarily vocal, it's not because we're not doing our job. It's because we've already done it and uh, continue to do it. I, I'm the board president, so God knows I'm on the phone with Dr. Toback. Uh, I probably talk to him more than his wife, which <laughs> it could be irritating. <laughs> yes, my husband. Um, but we do, we do. Uh, we just don't always come out and say things vocally here because I think at the end of the day, most of you know, who know us, understand that we all want the same thing. Uh, we're not happy with education during a pandemic. Uh, we're quite upset by it. And I think I exhibited a little frustration about all of it last week. And because we're starting to feel a little beaten down too, because we can't give everything. And we understand the frustration. And the comments that I made were not directed at any person, not even at a particular group. They're more at the situation. I receive communication from multiple sources, email. I look at some of the, <clears throat> my least favorite place, Facebook. Um, and sometimes things get a little out of hand. They get a little ugly. And I was responding to that. And Mrs. Jaffe, I know you a long time. I don't take shots at you. And I hope you know that. Uh, you're entitled to ask questions. You're entitled to make comments. And uh, those emails, Dr. Toback, I think he'll get to them next week, I'm hoping. Uh, if not, I'll look through them myself. And uh, yes, everyone's entitled to uh, speak their mind, ask questions, and articles are written for clicks, put it that way. Um, things were said and taken out of context, and that's unfortunate. But um, again, we all want the same thing. This is a proposal. Send in more questions if you have them or concerns, and we will address them. And hopefully before this school year is over, uh, we'll have more in-person instruction. That is definitely the goal. It has been from the beginning. Um, and we're looking forward to some of the guidelines being lifted, but that requires the virus numbers to drop. As you can see, they just went in the wrong direction. New Jersey has a very high rate. Uh, so I kind of agree with the callers who said, what does it matter if you leave the state, if we're in the hot state? So, um, you know, we're gonna have to do the best we can. And uh, that's all I have to say tonight. If anyone was offended by any of my comments, uh, I'm sorry if you were offended, but they weren't directed at anyone specific. And I'll leave it at that. So can I get a mover to close? Mr. Pavlak, Mr. Giordano, have a good night.